Thanks for tuning in to the episode of The Aiden Show, sponsored by our friends at Casa Homes. Enjoy the show. Welcome to The Aiden Show. The word Aiden means enlightened. That's exactly our goal. This podcast is to enlighten you, share knowledge and wisdom, and inspire our youth. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm Ahmed Oruch, and today's guest is Mustafa Ibn Muhammad. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me. Wa alaikum salam, brother. Wa alaikum salam. Look, um, you're from Afghanistan. You've you know moved around a little bit. We've got a very interesting story to to tell our viewers today, inshallah. Um, let's get straight into it. Uh, tell me a little bit about Afghanistan. What do you remember as a child growing up? Um, you know, I, I, I see it now on the news. A lot of bombs. A lot of you know different groups attacking each other. A lot of killing still going on there. What was it like back then for you as a child? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, I lived in Afghanistan between the years of uh, 1986 and 1992. So um, I left Afghanistan as a six and a half year old child. However, the things that I do remember about Afghanistan were the fightings, the bombs, the rockets that were flying uh, flying over, over our heads. There were no um, Air Force Air Force making attacks at the time like, uh, like they do now. Mm-hmm. So our rockets were unguided and um, they were just kind of go over our heads or they would hit anywhere. Mm. Yeah. There was no guidance systems. So uh, back in 86, when the Soviet Union were first uh, kicked out of Afghanistan, the uh, Mujahideen had gone over their struggles and um, Soviet Union... Tell, tell us about the Muhaj- Mujahideen. Who are they? The, the Mujahideen were, the, uh, were obviously the, the Muslimin that were uh, trying to... Um, get rid of the communist regime and the communist rule in Afghanistan, and especially get rid of the uh, the communists that had invaded Afghanistan. Okay. Alhamdulillah, they, their efforts were noble. Um, however, after the um, withdrawal of the Soviet unions and uh, the collapse of Soviet Union, some of them some of them decided to uh, you know hang their capes and return back to farming. Uh, and you know the the life that they had before that. Um, however, majority of them decided to stay and you know uh, have a fight for power. Um, so, unfortunately, the intentions were corrupted, and the actions that uh, that came out of that wasn't wasn't very very good for the uh, for the general population in Afghanistan. There were seven seven warlords that uh, first fought against the the puppet government that the Soviet Union left behind, um, yeah. the Dr. Najib's uh, regime. And uh, in 1992, the, uh, the government decided to hand over the authority over to, the, uh, to these warlords. Um, so in, in between this time, the, the wars, uh, they, there was fighting going all around. They, they, the fight was not just with the government. But you know, different uh, different groups were fighting amongst amongst themselves. Yeah. Uh, majority of the efforts were concentrated in Kabul uh, because that is the capital city. Um, but what were they there for? You know, what, the what, warlords? Yeah. What, well, not just the warlords. All these other superpowers that were involved. You know, what what are they fighting for? I understand that the the Afghani's are fighting for power. But what are the rest of these people that are in there fighting for? Like I know there's Russia in there. You've got America in there. I think you've got other countries that are also involved. Uh, well, the the struggle for Afghanistan from uh, looking at it from the looking at it from the um, point of view of the global politics, uh, it has everything to do with its geopolitical position. Mm. Uh, it has Russia to the to the north, Iran to the west, China to the northeast. Uh, has a massive border with Pakistan. So it's in a really good location. It's a it's a beautiful location for anybody. If if anybody can conquer it and yep. create the uh, military bases in there, leave their military bases in there, uh, it would be you know it would be beautiful for them. They would kind of control the entire region. Yeah, kind of kind of can relate to that because we know Turkey is also in a very good position. They've got Europe on one side, they've got the Middle East on the other. You know, um, a, a kind of a uh, way to get in from from both ways, so I guess Afghanistan's in a similar sort of boat with that. You know, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Uh, so since the first Anglo-Afghan war, it has been kind of uh, in the middle of a tug of war between different superpowers, um, and it's always been between Russia and the uh, Western states. 
Okay. Um, the English. What do you uh, think Russia's so involved in there? Well, the Russia is located there. You know, <laughs> Russia okay. has no choice but to be involved because uh, directly in the in its southern border, they they lies Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, now they do they do have the uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and all of those other yeah. countries in between. But back. Um, Back uh, when Soviet Union was a thing, all of those states were part of it, mm-hmm. and even now, they Russia has a massive influence in in those countries. So, the the way the uh, global powers look at it, the only country that uh, stands idle is Afghanistan, as in, in in terms of Russia, in terms of Iran, in terms of China. Every every other little states that are in between, they are kind of client states of you know those superpowers. Okay, yep. I was I was also told that. They've got some really good natural resources there. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Look, what have you learned um, now about the resources that Afghanistan has? The natural resources, the way uh, the Russians evaluated it at, at the time, uh, it was worth uh, $3 trillion. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the um, the technology that they had was a lot more primitive and perhaps they weren't able to, they weren't able to um, cover a larger area. But um, in terms of raw material, so uh, precious stones, precious metals, um, Helmand, uh, a southern province of Afghanistan, has, they've just recently discovered uh, a massive mine of lithium mm-hmm. that could, you know, basically power the, uh, the you know, well, well, there isn't much lithium at the moment. I mean, when we look at, um, you know, the countries that have got it, Australia has a fair bit of lithium and there are a few other countries in Africa that have got it. And now we're moving towards, um, you know, a future with cars that are going to be electrical. I mean, we okay. see that in Turkey with TOG, um, you know, uh, also um, in America, they've got the same thing with Tesla. Yeah. So that that is a very big, I guess, tick in the box. So you think that, it's because of these minerals that these superpowers are also attracted to. Uh, I would say that's that's a bonus. Okay, that's a that's a secondary uh, objective that they might have. Uh, we hear a lot of stories of uh, America stealing a lot of you know a lot of these precious resources from Afghanistan, which I don't think any any Afghan minds as long as you know they <laughs> it brings in peace. Yeah. Um, but no, definitely it is a, a secondary objectives. The mines are just a plus point. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, the geopolitical position of Afghanistan is definitely the number one thing that attracts everybody. Okay. Yeah. So, you, so you were a kid there. Um, tell me some of the precautions you used to take because it was a very rough place to be living in. Um, tell me some of the stories that you, know, you, you used to hear about and some of the things that you guys weren't allowed to do. Um, the uh, living at, uh, at those times, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of terrorism, you know, and it's in its pure, pure raw format. Um, obviously the rockets flying overhead was one thing, but there was also a lot of landmines that were planted overnight, uh, on, on roads, on, on, uh, public on, you know, places where a lot of, uh, people had access to mm-hmm. and, um, they would always create the trigger points to be an object that would attract a child, uh, a pen, a, a toy track, or uh, a teddy bear. Mm. And um, one of the precautions that we had to take, and I remember uh, commercials about it, that it always warned the kids, if you see something that is too good to be true on the road, don't take it. Wow. Um, a small little well, toy. Well, even, even money? Would they have put money on there? or? I- uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so, yeah. The value yeah. of that's a bit too much, isn't it? No, it had no value. It had no <laughs> it value. It had no value. Okay. Ooh, I guess children know. would be more attracted to the toy. The than, toys, absolutely. Than, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. the money, I mean, it got, it got to a point, obviously, you know, later on, it got to a point where the 100 rupee notes were being given as tickets for, you know, when you would go on and park your, uh, your cycle. Yeah. Uh, the person would rip a... Um, hundred rupee note into two pieces and this is a very well known fact wow. so you, you know how every note has a um a code yep. on either side so he would split that in half he would give you one side of it you know and he would keep the other and when you would come in to pick up your bike you would kind of give the half of the hundred rupee note, and he would match the number and he would know okay this is yours and you can take it interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. so the value of money of course you know war does that that yeah. brings instability and with instability the the economy takes a hit 
Yeah, but why were they placing mines for little kids? Like, why, why would anyone do something like that? Allahu alam, Allahu alam. Um, I don't believe that it was the action that was preferred for the warlords of the time, you know, to, to Afghans, uh, whichever side they were fighting for. I don't think that they wanted to create that kind of uh, uh, instability mm. because they wanted to rule over it rather than destroy it. Um, I know a lot of... Uh, foreign powers and foreign regime had a lot of different interests, yeah. um, so perhaps it was used as a uh, as a way to scare the public, you know, uh, distract them, keep them in their homes, while you know, perhaps they were stealing. <laughs> Allahu yeah. Alam. Yeah, I guess only so. speculation. True. Uh, well, tell me. You said there's a, there was a lot of bombs flying past. Um, what would happen? Let's say you're at home with your family and you hear a rocket. You know, flying past. Yeah. What would you guys do? Um, so we we were we were trained by our father very very simply um, that as soon as we hear the rockets, uh, it, the different rockets made different sounds, and we were kind of educated in those as well. You know, different rockets um, damaged in different ways. Some had shrapnels, others others had a penetrative power. So we were we were told that whenever you hear the rocket just duck under the table uh we had a wooden dinner table yeah. you know and the houses in there are built of 100 percent out of concrete yeah. so if a piece of concrete falls on a, a wooden table <laughs> <laughs> it won't be doing much to uh to protect us but that 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 was that that was all that we could do you know yeah kinda, i guess it, it'll make you feel safe just being under there with your family you know you guys together yeah absolutely yeah yeah it was just it was just a little thing. I remember one of, one, of, one of the other things that I remember, I remember my father telling my mother that um, when we got clothes for Eid, say during Ramadan, we weren't supposed to wait for Eid to put those brand new clothes on because uh, nobody knew who's going to live, mm. who's going to live until then. So my father kind of made that into a, into a rule for us. You know, Whatever we got, whether it was brand new or it wasn't, we would put that on right then, so we would kind of make use of it. There was no save, save for tomorrow because tomorrow wasn't promised for anybody. Yeah. Uh, that that was, you know, tomorrow isn't promised for anybody, but... Even a good that point now, exactly, you know, even yeah. a good point now. Look, I, I mean, you want to obviously attract, um, well, not attract, but you obviously want to make your kids happy. And, you know, around us at the moment, children die all the time. So to give them Absolutely. something that's going to please them, to make them happy, you know, why not give it straight away instead of waiting for a particular moment? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah look, yeah. Um, did you have any near-death experiences? Like, I mean, with all this happening, um, was there any, any day that, you know, you were close to getting hit by a bomb or, you know, any, anything like that at all? Um, there was obviously a lot of, a lot of kind of, you know, knee misses. There was a lot yeah. of rockets that, that hit our neighbours. Allah Azza wa Jal had willed it for us that... Um, we weren't going to go through that, but a lot of our neighbors were hit. And um, but yeah, uh, the near death experience that I that I experienced and felt, it wasn't uh, through bombs and mines and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I remember I was I would have been almost six years old, and uh, I have an older brother. Um, he's seven years senior to me, so uh, he would have been around thirteen years old. And um, we were playing one early morning. Uh, I must have been very noisy, making a lot of noise, and he kept on telling me to stay quiet. Uh, but I kept on going. So he grabbed me and um, he kind of tried to, you know, shut my mouth with his hand. Uh, but he didn't know that he had also blocked my nostrils, so I couldn't <sighs> breathe. Oh, no way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I remember, I remember like it was yesterday, you know, it was very plain and clear. Um, that I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm throwing my arms and my legs everywhere, uh, kind of trying to kick and scream, but I couldn't scream. And I'm, uh, my intention is to tell him that he's not just blocked my mouth, but he's also blocked my nostrils and I can't breathe. Mm. And I'm kind of struggling and, and he keeps telling me to, uh, to stay quiet and I'll let you go. And so finally he lets go and I'm, and I'm screaming at him. I'm trying to scream at him that he, I couldn't breathe and he grabs me again. He tells me I'm not going to let you go until you stay quiet. Um, obviously he didn't know and I think he still doesn't know. I haven't told him the story. Uh, so um, he, he, he like 
kept me. Did, did you have a chance to when he when he let you go? Did you have a chance to like take another breath in? Or, I didn't. Or I what? didn't. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. So, yeah, so I was gasping for air, and uh, when he let go, you know, I wasn't clever enough to you know breathe in, and then start to start uh, speaking. But it, when he grabbed me again, uh, I I couldn't. So my entire focus was on my lungs, trying to expand, trying to take some air in, and. Um, and I'm hearing him, you know, in my ear telling me that I'm not going to let you go until you, and, and, until you keep quiet. So I struggled as much as I did. And when I noticed that there was, there was no use, my lungs cannot expand. Um, I, can't, I can't take another breath. Um, I kind of let go. I let go of, uh, of struggling, you know, of struggling to tell him to let me go. I want to breathe. I kind of let it go and uh, surrendered myself, you know, as a as a six-year-old child was surrendered to death, wow. not knowing of life, what, what we know as grown-ups, um, I kind of I kind of let go. And I, I felt a peace. The Arabic word for it would be sakina. Mm. I felt a peace that um, it was beautiful. You know, these words cannot explain it. It was, it was something that was felt in that moment. And um, I chased after that, that's, you know, that same feeling for quite some time and uh, of course as a as a grown-up uh, I found it when I went to sujood and um, I told Allah Azza wa Jal that I surrender myself to you I surrender my will to you um, that's that's when I felt that peace again okay yeah wow. so yeah that the experience the experience the need that experience it wasn't uh, a traumatizing experience obviously it kept um, you know stayed with me but it wasn't a bad one. So how did it stay with you? What, what, how did it shape you as a man? I had always, you know, it, it was always with me. I always remembered it. I always remembered that, that peace that I had, like in that moment. Yeah. Um, death wasn't something to be, you know, to be afraid of. The end of life, you know, was just the end of an illusion. Now, of course, this is, um, as I grew up, I kind of started discovering this. But the feeling that I had at that time, it was so beautiful that... Um, Perhaps it is the single most beautiful experience of my life. I guess, um, yeah, doing it oh, well, going through that as a kid for the first time might be uh, different for, say, us adults now, you know, because we've got so much going on around us, you know, family and am I going to go to heaven, am I going to go to hell? But as an innocent child that, that's in that state, um, yeah, the, the, you're sinless. Absolutely, you're yeah. Thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. We not, don't, I, you know, as a, as, a, as a child, we don't have that, that baggage yeah, exactly. The carry, yeah. We have a lot of memories as a, as a grown man. You know, we we we've sent a lot. Yeah, we have sought our loved ones perhaps. and our children. Of, and, exactly. you know, that, that a lot of responsibilities as yes. well. What's going to happen to my family once I go? Yep. What's going to happen to my kids? Yeah, Definitely. it would be a very different experience if we have it as a as a grown up. Yeah. Look, um, what what did your parents do back then for work? How did they provide? How did, what did your father and mother do? My father was a civil engineer. Um, he studied. Uh, normal so afghanistan before prior to um uh, to the soviet invasion was a was a relatively normal kind of a place there were schools there was there was somewhat of a government the economy was functional or not and my father would have gone through school in uni just just as anybody does and um he had a government post as a civil engineer working on he was working on different projects one of the things that he spoke about a lot was the uh was the dams um mm-hmm. to generate electricity uh, they are still functional to this day um my mother was a teacher um she specialized in chemistry and biology and she was teaching um kind of the e11s and e12s like the vces that we have over here but the income combined wasn't enough because because money wasn't worth much during the war times when i was when i was alive when i was born um so my father had to take up a second shift uh and he had to pick up a skill embroidery and uh, work as a uh, and he did that he he did that in afghanistan he did that in afghanistan yes i know know a little bit about embroidery because uh, i just got my business um uh, t-shirts and uh, polo tops done. Um, so you've got uh, what was it called again? You've got the uh, 
uh, screen printed t-shirts. Yep. Um, you know, they're like ink going into the in, into the material. And then embroidery is more stitched. Yes, that could yes. be hand stitched or could be done with uh, a machine. With a machine, yeah, exactly. So um, it's very odd though, like. Or a civil engineer and somebody like your mother that's very intelligent, you know, teaching VCE students to be getting not enough money in, a, in, a, in, a, in any country. I wouldn't have ever expected that because if you're here in Australia, you combine two of that, you, you, you're doing okay. You, you know, you're hitting the at least the 300,000s or you know, two, two to 300,000 dollars a year, which, which provides enough. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, my father was, he said he was getting 5,000 Afghani rupees a month which uh, before war, that, that would have been, you know, sufficient to run a family, no problem. Yeah. But, <clears throat> of course, when war begins, economy collapses, money loses its value. Yeah. The, uh, the thing we said about the 100, 100 uh, Afghani rupees, you know, being used as a ticket, yep. it's, it's worthless. Makes sense. Yeah. So wh- wh- what was your father thinking? Was he thinking, okay, well, I'm not making enough to, to support my family, you know, what, what did he need to do? Um, my father, what he would have been thinking at the time would have been um, in, in terms of um, uh, basically endurance to endure the tough times just until stability comes back on. Um, they, they would have been, obviously, him being a government employee, he would have hoped that the government would have done something to stabilize the situation, but it didn't. So back in 1992, when the government decided and announced that we will be handing over the government to the warlords. It was something very clear to everybody mm-hmm. that uh, even if these group of warlords that has been fighting for power uh, with each other, even if they kind of create a, um, a stable uh, government, th- it's not going to happen without a lot of fighting. So everybody knew that there was going to be you know, tough times ahead, there was going to be a lot of fighting happening, uh, a civil war, basically. So when my father saw that in 1992, he decided to leave. Okay. And uh, we basically, as soon as we heard, uh, you know, we packed up and uh, we hired a, uh, a massive lorry and we, you know, moved to Pakistan. Why Pakistan? Uh, Pakistan was the easiest choice. Pakistan, um, obviously... The, Back then, there was a lot of migration happening. There were there were people going to Tajikistan, but then Tajikistan again is a um, you know um, a kind of a communist uh, client state. Okay, so it wouldn't have been an ideal place, uh, even though it is now. Uh, it would have been back then. The options were Iran and Pakistan, and we heard a lot of bad things about Iran. You know, the migrants being uh, ill treated over there. So we headed to Pakistan. Pakistan was the easiest one as well because all we had to do was cross a mountain. So go to the, uh, you know, southern end of Afghanistan and just cross a mountain and boom. That easy. Yeah, yeah, you're in Pakistan. (laughs) Starting your life. Yeah, yeah. And and the border basically goes through um, the Pashtun tribes. So it kind of splits the Pashtuns over one side and the Pashtuns over the other side. So it was very easy for us because the Pashtuns were welcoming people on both sides. Uh, all so, we had so you, to do is cross so you crossover. over. You guys are in Pakistan. What's next? I mean, how, how does your dad start all over? How does the family start all over again? Um, well, it would have been it would have been a very tough situation that my father was in, because obviously we took we took minimum minimum things from Afghanistan. First of all, we don't have a massive amount of wealth, you know, going through war. Um, but to make the move to Pakistan, we basically had to had to uproot ourselves and just take whatever we could with us. Um, so we didn't have much. My father, um, there was no way for him to you know to to go on and just apply for a job in Pakistan. Okay. The Pakistani regime back then didn't have a, uh, any any kind of official policy towards immigration. You know, we crossed over without a visa. There was no passport, there was no identification card, nothing. We simply just crossed over, you know, um, and, and tried to start life. Um, my father had his uncle in Peshawar, mm. uh, which is just over the other side of the border. Um, and he helped us out, you know, just as, as much as he could. As a good brother would do, yeah. That's right, as much as he could. And we stayed with him perhaps for a month while my father went to the capital city. Islamabad, mm-hmm. uh, being the capital city, you would you would imagine that it would be the busiest, and there's, there would be a lot of job opportunities and whatnot. Yep. So, um, 
My father went over to Islamabad, to the capital city, and uh, found a flat for us to live in. Mm. There was a lot of migration happening from Afghanistan into Pakistan. So the Pakistani people were kind of used to the idea of Afghans coming over and looking for a place to live with, you know, while they don't have any money. So they, they obviously were uh, helpful and understanding of that particular situation. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, we had a small two-room flat um, in, in one of the apartments. And uh, my father began uh, embroidery with one of my uncles. So he got back into embroidery. So embroidery he was, in was the only second, option. Yeah, so he was doing that in Afghanistan as a second job. And now yeah. in Pakistan, it became uh, a full-time primary, job, even yes. though your mum and your dad's got qualifications. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Pakistani, Pakistani government didn't... Um, they didn't have a policy. I mean, I have to be fair to them. You know, they didn't have a policy of immigration, so uh, the Afghan kids couldn't couldn't go to school uh, in, in Pakistani school. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Afghan, they were whether they were engineers or they were doctors, whatever they were, whatever their qualifications were, um, they couldn't have a government post. Yeah, in Pakistan, uh, but there was obviously a lot of private clinics that did employ um, Afghan doctors. But obviously for an engineer, you don't have a private private firm. Um, Afghanistan, Pakistan is still, majority of the sectors are owned by the government. Mm. So there's no privatization that has occurred in, in those regions. Okay. Um, so everything is owned by the government. All right. Um, well, how did you guys get treated? Like how was, how was you as an Afghani in Pakistan treated with, you know... Um, the, the citizens that live there, the Pakistani people that live there, um, you know, some some of the it was there like ever uh, a situation where you felt like okay because I'm Afghani they're treating my family members any differently. The uh, the Pakistani people they were very welcoming individuals. They they had no no quarrels you know with us. They understood our situation. They were very hospitable, uh, especially as young kids. We were speaking their language. So they didn't treat us much different, but the police was a different was a different um, story altogether. Mm. They, of course, you you might know of the stories of corruption amongst the police force in India. That kind of you know crosses know the, over borders. I know the well. corruptions of Turkey. Uh, you know, a, a long time ago, my father and his friends used to talk about it a lot. Whenever they would go there, they would have to hand over a you know a note with uh, whatever it whatever the price of it was worth to kind of get the police to look the other way or yes. to drive off yep. or, you know, so. Yeah, Bribery was, uh, exists everywhere, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, so. I think. It, we, it is a lot better now. Like I'm, uh, we, we look at, I've, I've travelled there three years ago and I've seen nothing like that and they're very strict now. I mean, um, since since uh, the new government's taken over, uh, he's fixed a lot of things. But um, before, yeah, going by what a lot of people would say, there was a lot of corruption. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. and if, if the economy of a country isn't doing well, yeah. corruption that that format of corruption would uh, would kind of prevail in the society. But anything that you've seen in Turkey mm. out of you know the police corruption in the past, it would uh, dwarf it basically. I mean, the amount of corruption um, within the Indian and Pakistani police force, you have never seen it anywhere <laughs> else. I, mean, I can they, just I can just imagine. Like we did have we did have terrorism. So we did have, you know, a terrorist group that was infiltrated in in a lot of, say, in parliament, you know, in high end uh, judges were were part of that type of group, um, you know, police officers, people in the army, you know, they tried to overthrow the the government um, recently, so there was that. But um, I think the new prime minister was a little bit more switched on, and um, you know, saw what happened in history. And kind of knew what was coming and, and put an end to all of them, you know, captured all of them, put them in prison. Yep. So, um, but I can just imagine like India, you know, with, with what I'm seeing now on TV, the way they're hitting, you know, people that are starving. They're obviously going out because they've got no homes, they've got no shelter. Majority of the people are poor, um, trying to find bread from somewhere, maybe in a rubbish bin. And, and you know, you're going to get beaten to death because Absolutely. of it. Um, you know, like Trump going there, for example, 30 people, 30 Muslims getting. St- I saw a video, it was pretty horrific, yep. getting stumped to death yep. over Trump visiting, you know. So, yeah, it is completely, yep. completely different. Yeah, the situation in India has gone worse. But, I mean, back when we were in Pakistan, it wasn't like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the new government taken over, the Moody government, yep. um, it has turned things upside down. But the government 
prior to him, uh, before him, it was a lot better. But what was it like? Um, for, so, what was it like for you, for you guys? Uh, what sort of corruption was happening for the with the Afghani people? You know, in in Pakistan, the uh, the well, one of the main things that we experienced was threats from from the police. So the police back then they were telling us that the police had to pay thirty thousand uh, Pakistani rupees, which they call it kaldar, uh, Pakistani rupees, to uh, get a position in the police. Yeah. So they actually had to buy it, and once they bought it, the um, the the people in charge of the police force kind of looked the other way when they were making the extra money because everybody understood that every position is bought. Mm. So they have to, you know, like a business, they have to now have a prop income. Um, so one of the uh, one of the main issues that the Pakistanis, the Pakistani police force had towards the Afghans were financial. They knew that majority of the Afghans had uh, um, a kind of a financial assistant from overseas. Um, either America or Canada, you know, uh, Australia. So, so family, family members that would obviously... Family members, yeah. I send the family members that were willing to help somebody, you know, in, yeah, even in a if, situation. Even a few, I guess even a few hundred dollars being sent is a lot of money, you know, in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan, especially during those times. So yeah. Back when I, when I remember it, uh, a, a one US dollar was 34 uh, equivalent to 34 kaldar. Uh, so what would that buy you though? Would, yes. that, would that get you bread, milk, water? That would get you everything. You know why? Yeah, <laughs> okay. uh, that would get you everything. Things, uh, when we first went to Pakistan, you know, there was an inflow of um, refugees coming in with financial assistance. Mm. So initially when, when we got there back in 1992, things were very cheap. But because all of this money is coming in, you know, these dollars are coming in, the pounds are coming in, Everything has started to slowly, slowly get expensive. But initially, everything was cheap. And the Pakistani people kind of sometimes would express their, um, their concern, saying that, you know, after the Afghans came over, you know, everything became expensive. Before that, things were very cheap, very easy to find. Yeah. Uh, because Afghans are bringing all of these, uh, you know, uh, financial assistance to the society. Everybody kind of realized that now there's a lot of demand with, you know, with limited supplies, so they were able to jack up their prices. Hmm. Um, so the the police, going back to the police thing, the the police wanted but, but money. Let me let me yep. uh, thing on that. I guess we've got something like that in Turkey where it's Syrian refugees. We've got a huge amount of Syrian refugees. We're, we're the biggest in the world. Um, you know, there's five million of them. When I was traveling, I, was, I would see them on the streets trying to you know sell water and trying to make a living. Um, you know, so like a lot of people there also see it similarly. Like they, yeah. they see it in a way where, okay, our jobs are kind of going away now because we've got these people. Um, however, like you said, with the Pakistani people, they, they were, a lot of the Turkish citizens understood what was happening and, and, yep. s- and would respect them being there. Yep. They wouldn't Absolutely, be happy about yeah. it, but they'll respect them being there. Of course, yeah. of course. Of course, the situation of uh, Turkey is a lot different to what Pakistan was going through at the time. Because you guys Turkey's are going through a are. war and yeah, and Pakistan also, you know, weren't, wasn't doing too well in terms of e- economic. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. They had, I mean, uh, back then the only thing that I remember they were exporting was uh, leather. Mm. You know, that's all. <laughs> Yeah. So the economy wasn't doing as as well as uh, the the Turkish economy is doing now, yeah. and the Syrian refugees that are coming into Turkey, they're not bringing a financial assistance with them. No, they're not. The Afghans had a backing, you know, from from overseas, from other Afghans and overseas, that uh, kind of kind of some of them, you know, the ones that were uh, receiving large uh, packages, they were living like kings in there, and mm. you know, so. And on the other hand, if somebody didn't, which we didn't at that time, uh, if, if you if you could find work and feed yourself, you could. If yeah. you if you didn't, you, you know you didn't. So whenever the economy would kind of take a take a little bit of a hit, and people wouldn't you know be bringing clothings uh, to to be embroidered, because embroidery really is like you know a, a thing that somebody would do if they have extra money. Yeah. So when there's no extra money, there would be no embroidery. They might make clothes, but there would be no embroidery on them. Um, and so there, I, I do remember times that uh, we had nothing to eat. We what, were what, so what were you doing when you had nothing to eat? Uh, we would uh, yogurt. I mean, you know, we would we would put. So you, so you still had uh, a, a something. Um, we small. yeah, of course. Yeah. Instead of instead of uh, two or three meals a day, we would have one. Yeah. Early in the morning, we would have uh, tea with sugar. 
okay. with uh, uh, leftover pieces of bread, which uh, the bread back then they make them fresh. The bread, uh, the bakery makes them fresh. So if you if you leave a bread that you bought in the morning for the next day, it becomes rock hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we had to dip them in in warm tea yeah. and leave them there. You know, just just to become eatable. That sounds uh, tough. It is, yeah, 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 and of, of course there were other times when we had so much money that you know we couldn't count it. Yeah. Um, it, what I mean by it is that the it, it was it, everything was connected with the economy. If if the if you had work, you had an income, you had food to eat. If you didn't, you didn't. So unlike unlike what we have grown up over here. That if you don't have work, like you know the the situation that we're going through now, if you don't have work, you know the government's going to take care of you. Yeah, you you'll always have you know the same kind of food to eat every day. That's you true. would be able to afford it even you know even if you don't have an income. Yeah, look, going back to um, you said the police were doing cor- like they were corrupt. They were they weren't treating you guys really good. You know they were t- they knew that there was some type of money coming in. What were they doing to get that money away from the Afghanis into their pockets? They would do everything they could. Um, I I I don't remember hearing any cases where they they did kill anybody okay. or somebody went missing. But they would do everything up to that point. So one of the um, one of the things, one of the stories that was told to me was that they would obviously have some informants within the um, you know within the community that they would reward if they had brought a piece of valuable information to them. So if somebody was receiving a large sum of money, say um, 500 US dollars back then, that was a lot of money. So if somebody was receiving 500 uh, US dollars, they would have to go to a particular point to pick that, pick that money up. They couldn't just go into, you know, any shop. Uh, There was a little bit of a distance between them. Um, So they would go and pick it up. And this informant would inform the police saying that um, this guy is uh, bringing so much money at this day, at this time. Um, and these police would then go on and kind of raid them, you know, and stop them in the, in, the middle of, um, in the middle of their journey. And they would say, show me your paperwork. And obviously no Afghans had any kind of a paperwork. You know, show me your ID. And, and they wouldn't. So the next thing that they would say is, uh, let, let's go back to the station and I'm going to take your fingerprints and, you know, go, go through the procedure. And on the way over there, uh, they will take them to some bushland, somewhere, you know, secluded. Uh, usually it was a forest. Um, Pakistan is dense, you know. Uh, I saw the Himalayas and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I don't know if it's similar to that, you know, uh, mountainy, a lot of forests, you know, heaps of rivers and stuff like that. Can yep. you tell us a little bit about what Pakistan, it looks like? Yeah, it's the, the the landscape is beautiful, absolutely okay. beautiful. The uh, they do have some mountains. I mean, it's not as uh, it's not as mountainous as Afghanistan is, but they do have mountains and they have a lot of greenery. Like they say, if the concrete was to crack under the heat because it's really hot, if the concrete was to crack without doing anything, grass would grow from underneath it. Amazing. That's so, how so it is. A more uh, fertile fertile place absolutely, compared yeah, to yeah. Afghanistan absolutely yeah okay. of course of course Afghanistan doesn't compare in its fertility to uh, to Pakistan it's absolutely beautiful um, I'll show you a couple of clips of uh, the, this masjid that King Faisal built and the scenery it's it's amazing yeah, I, I, I love I love Pakistan yeah. um I guess we'll talk about you going back there later on but so we're, we're in the forest these police yep. are trying to yep. rob uh, yep. Afghanis yep what do I do yeah. next? They uh, they will they will try to in- intimidate the person. So if the person would easily give up the money, they'll take the money and let them uh, you know send them home. If uh, the person will resist, they will try whatever technique that that was available to them, uh, up to the point of putting a gun you know at, at the back of their head, kind of making it look as if this is going to be an execution, and uh, they will do that all the way up until that point. And if you know the person would give the money up, majority of the cases would. Some people that, you know, were really desperate for that money and it wasn't just an item of luxury. That was their livelihood. They were going to feed their family with it. They would kind of, you know, resist as much as they could. And this one particular story that I heard from, from the brother, he, he said he had a uh, hidden pocket made in his trousers and he had kept it there and the police kept on checking him, kept on saying, look, we know it's you. We know we know that you have this this amount of money. Uh, give it to us. Otherwise, we're going to kill you down here. Nobody's going to ask for you. Nobody's going to find your body. And, um, you know, 
after we've killed you, we'll search you and we'll find it. And he kept on saying, look, you guys have the wrong person. Um, until they, you know, they, they, they tried to search him a few times and they couldn't find anything, so they let him go. And, you know, this is so what So what, that's one of the lucky ones. Hey, of course, of course, he was lucky and uh, hard-headed at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Because they give up sat him life. down. Yeah, 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 they sat him down. They put the gun uh, at the back of his head. Wow. Any anyone else would have said, "Okay, here, take it. Yeah, <laughs> Just yeah. let me go." Yeah, lost more precious. More Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. Even even if you are in a desperate situation, but that that was the basic occurrence. Um, of course, that's that's the extreme cases when people would be when, when the police knew that they were receiving large sums of money. Um, generally, you know, I've, uh, they, this happened a lot with everybody. But I remember my father being pulled up, you know, because they know. Who's Afghan and who's Pakistani? They won't. They won't stop a, a, a Pakistani guy. They they would know who the immigrant is. Yeah. And uh, you know, my, my father was taken for a ride quite a few times. Like they would, they would say, "Just give me fifty rupees, uh, just just enough." They say chai chai pani or um, you know just what means which just means. A, just a um, tea, a tea yes, yeah, yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah, yeah, just just tea and a bread, you know. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, you know, so. Something, something to snack on. Something exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just for the snack, and, and of course, my father always said no. Oh, good on him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stood the, his ground. The money didn't come easy. That's why. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. You guys also struggled with schooling. Um, you know, as a child, you said that uh, that the government didn't have any policies in place, so you know, for the kids, they couldn't go to schools. What happened to majority of the Afghani kids? I mean, did, did they? Did you guys? Um, you know go to work at a young age or was there was there some other means of you know um was there some other means of schooling um we did have other means of schooling we had to create so the afghan community would have had to create the school systems themselves okay uh we didn't have the resources we had some some may have had um some help from united nations uh, obviously it wasn't easily accessible to us we had to go through a lot of different channels and a lot of different people would actually kind of come in and find us and see see what the situation is. And then uh, United Nations would help us just a little bit. But uh, the school the school that I went to, when we first came to uh, Pakistan, uh, it was in a three-room apartment that was hired by one of the individuals. Um, uh, her name was uh, Noor, Nuria, Nuria Salehi, I, I believe. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, it was a long time ago. Um, and she had created this school uh, basically uh, w- with with very minimum help. And we had to pay 100 rupees, Pakistani rupees, a month uh, to kind of, you know, just just pay for the cost, pay for the rent. Get it to function. Get it, yeah. Yes, get, get it going. Uh, keep it up. Uh, the school was named after, after well, one of the um, female Afghan champions, Malalai. Um, and we studied for three hours a day, six days a week. We, I remember we studied uh, 20, uh, 20 different subjects at one point. <laughs> <laughs> we had very few teachers that was teaching in three different, different schools. Of course, you know, those teachers were very hard to come by because they were paid next to nothing. And they, you know, and they would have to come in and teach these kids. Was your mum one of those teachers? My mother was not. No, no, no. My, my mother uh, found a job uh, teaching how to how to net, okay. a specific kind of net, um, sea hook knitting. Okay. Uh, it's referred in, uh, in the organization Save the Children. So Save the Children had set up a class for Afghan women to, um, to gain a skill. And the skill was basically netting, uh, sea hook netting that was very popular uh, in overseas. And they, they would make these handmade bags and save the children will kind of uh, take it, you know, um, to uh, Western countries and sell them over there and then use that money to kind of, you know, get the, get the program going. That sounds, uh, it sounds yeah. really good. Yeah, it was, it was, sure. uh, it was needed. Um, my sister was one of those teachers in, in, in one of the, in one of those schools, um, so yeah, the there was no there was no official school system that we had back then. Yeah. Uh, so you know, these teachers would do whatever they could. We we would go with whatever textbook that we could find. I remember 
we were still being supplied from uh, Peshawar, from the warlords. These textbooks, mathematics that basically was counting how many bullets and <laughs> no way yeah and a magazine and a question of how to uh, you know even even from the olden days how, how to blow up a, a russian tank how much ordinance did you know did, did, this was maths <laughs> wow. yeah yeah absolutely, absolutely. that's and a cool that's a cool math how to blow up a tank <laughs> yeah that's cool how to blow up yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. they call them the northern polar bears wow. the russians that was that was their nickname had to blow, you know, had to blow up their tanks, how much ordinance is needed. You know, the uh, the mathematics was basically, you know, the, the problem solving that, that we were given. If if this boy has 30, um, 30 rounds of bullets and each magazine takes, say, 25, uh, how many, you know, there's... That 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 trying that's to work it, trying to work it out like that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Get yeah. your mind going. It with, was with everything, everything to do with war. Um, and obviously, obviously, the warlords, you know, because there was no oversight on these schools, the warlords were trying to uh, kind of uh, get their next generation of fighters mm. from amongst them, intelligent ones. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to calculate exactly, things and, yeah, and blow yeah, up yeah. tanks. Okay. Yes, how to blow up tanks and how to fill up the uh, machine gun magazines and all that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so look, you said um, that the school was named after a champion or yes. someone very... Yes. Um, Influential within the Afghanis. Who, who is that? Uh, her her name is Malalay. She's uh, referred to as Malalay of Maywand. So Maywand was one of the battles that Afghans won over the um, the English, the British, in the Second Afghan Anglo War. This is back in 18, uh, 1880. Uh, so the the story that we were told, and the stories that that has been um, recorded, is that. Back then, everybody had to participate in war. You know, it's, it's tribal. Every village has to participate. The man and the woman. The man, obviously, in the capacity of uh, fighting head on, and the woman as a as as a support uh, to kind of you know um, deliver the ordinance, feed them food, and uh, take care of the campsite and whatnot. Um, Malale of Maywand was the daughter of one of the farmers that had participated in that war. And the story goes that the Afghans were losing moral because even though they had a massive number, uh, they had the numbers on their side, the uh, the English were winning. So they were thinking about retreating, you know. Like the, the, the scene was a little bit chaotic. And Malale, this, the version that I heard uh, back in school, that Malale took her hijab off and kind of waved it in the air, uh, reciting poetry to these young Afghan soldiers that basically stated that you guys have lost all of your ghayra, you know, your protective jealousy. Might as well the British come over and take over your woman. But the way she said it is that uh, the might as well someone else come in and save you as in the British and then put the mark of shame on you. So take all of your women with them. Wow. And that was the one moment that everybody kind of lost their minds. Like, how, how, how can that happen, you know? This is this is coming from one of our, one of our own women, and everybody kind of you know uh, got up and started fighting, and of course she then continued. Um, some of the other versions they say that she was waving the flag, the Afghan flag. Yeah. Um, I don't think flags were a big deal back then, back in the 1880s, uh, in tribal societies, um, mainly uh, dominated by Islam rather than nationalism. So yeah, I think I think it would have been her hijab. Right. And she has been recorded in the Afghan history as, as the champion of the second Afghan Anglo war. That was one. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, I know a little bit about you. So you've, you've kind of, by going to Afghanistan, Pakistan, you decided that Islam wasn't for you. Um, you know, how old were you when you started to realize that, that it wasn't for you? I would have been around eight. Um, I, I remember vaguely that I, I kind of started started noticing that people people can lie. So they might believe one thing in their heart and say something else. Mm. And I kind of, you know, got that from, from the, um, you know, the interactions that people would have with one another. Somebody would say something with guy A, and then when guy B comes in, he would say something else to him. So when I witnessed this, I kind of realized that, you know, People have different faces with, with different people. Is, is, was it, were they using Islam 
Were they no, using religion? No, no. Were they saying I'm a Muslim? You know, do business with me? Is, is, is that some of the stuff that that, that was? Yes, of yeah. course, that was a fact. But I, was, I it, was it mainly because you're in Afghanistan, you're around Muslims, you're in Pakistan, you're around a lot of Muslims, and these people, are all, majority of them, are corrupt. The uh, the society, of course, is uh, Muslim. They majority ninety nine percent. Afghanistan ninety nine point nine percent. They say uh, nobody's really done a headcount, but um, the only other religion that we have there is Sikhism. A very minor, you know, very small, uh, small population. You may have heard them on the news lately uh, with the attacks and whatnot. Um, but Pakistan has a a small number of Christians that may have migrated there. Uh, they do have some other migrants coming from uh, African countries. They might be Christian as well. So they, uh, Pakistan might be say 90, 98, 95, 98 percent Muslim. And um, the way the way the culture works is that they don't speak Arabic. They read Arabic, but they don't speak Arabic. So uh, the the broader society has no idea uh, what the rulings of Islam is because they can't. Even though they read Quran, they don't understand it. Mm. So they don't they don't have an in depth understanding of it. Uh, majority of it comes from the few teachers. That have kind of uh, placed themselves in positions of religious authority, that kind of dictates the rules to everybody. But of course, when the uh, when the general population has no idea whether the teacher you know that is teaching everybody is actually teaching Quran or Sunnah or not, it would be difficult for them. They would only they they they'd pretty much take whatever they uh, that the teacher would have to say, mm-hmm. and this is more uh, apparent in Afghanistan in the Afghan society going through war and going through all of that uh, the schools being shut the now nowadays there are a lot of ma- uh, madrasas there's a lot of madaris the uh, religious schools that teaches young and old yeah um, but going back what, what put you off what put me off was uh, when I started evaluating you know the um, the people around me when I saw when I realized that people can can say one thing and do something else I kind of started paying attention a little bit more to to the speech and the actions and uh, what I realized and this is a thing that they used to say a lot is that the bigger the beard the bigger the lie so if a person grew the largest beard they would be the guy that would be so, lying so it's good the that most. I'm keeping mine short then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this society is different my brother this society is different but yeah, the uh, the Afghan and the Pakistani society they they realize that the beard makes them money. The beard is the easiest way for them to be fed, for them to be in a position of authority. So it had nothing to do with you trying to leave a country because we had one of what I usually do with the Aiden shows before a guest comes on. I'll give a little bit of an intro on Facebook about you know who they are. Um, a little bit about their story and if anyone wants to ask questions we had one of our facebook um uh, viewers uh one of our uh, one of the guys that are a part of our uh, group asked a question of was it because you wanted to immigrate to a christian country like australia like apparently a lot of afghanis what they would do is they'll move away from islam to come to australia saying that they're christians did have any, was that anything that passed you? Not, not at all. No, okay. no, that, that that wasn't a thing. It, it, it was a thing that used to, you know, used to float around that, you know, this guy. So you uh, did converted. hear of it? We did hear of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. This guy converted into uh, Christianity and then went to, um, uh, you know, went to one of these America Western Russia. countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. They, they went over there and then as soon as they went over there, they said, nope. Uh, I convert back, <laughs> <laughs> and and you know they were joking that now they have uh, discovered that these people are actually doing that. So whenever somebody says, "Look, I've converted into Christianity. I'm in danger," they would say, "Give your life for Christ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just die down here. <laughs> we're not well, going to take you." Because we had, no, it was we had Tony Abbott ch- change a little bit of the immigration policy, where he did turn around and and kind of do a racist sort of thing and say, um, "You know, we're not going to allow this amount." We're not going to allow as many Muslims as we used to take in. We're going to only allow this many from now on. Yep. So I can understand why you know anyone from any country would turn around and say, "Hey, I'm no longer a Muslim. I'm actually a Christian." Yep. You know, or change their name before yep. they would come here, and and then obviously once they're citizens, change it back. Yep. These no these these programs might seem like you know from where we sit might seem like it's very apparent over there, but it's not. When you live within that society, it's not it's not a thing that somebody considers. Um, when my when my wife was coming over to Australia. Um, during the times that we did her paperwork, uh, she had to go through a medical examination. 
Now, the Australian government only um, accepts certain doctors, not everyone. And the one that they had to go to was the German hospital in Kabul. And uh, my brother-in-law, you know, tells a story that he went and he knocked on the door. Obviously, it, it has to be a very secure environment. He knocked on the door and, you know, the, uh, the soldier opened, the Afghan soldier opened the, the little flap and said, are you guys here uh, for the conversion? He goes, what? <laughs> you know, because it's, it's, not, it's, it's not something that people are familiar with over there that these uh, Westerners that go into Afghanistan, they also want to, you know, want to get people to convert. Uh, so he said, no, we're here for the medical. He said, oh, he goes, okay, okay, come in on, yeah, come on in. Wow. Yeah. They do have programs like that. It's not as popular as you, as you would think. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, growing up in, in Afghanistan, a person that grows up in Afghanistan and Pakistan, they are filled with, with, with pride, you know. There's this pride that I'm not going to uh, take a knee down. And converting your religion, you know, converting from Islam into another religion to to, ha- to get a worldly gain from it is perhaps um, the the clear identification for them that they have lost all pride, mm. that, you know, they, they don't have the ghira anymore. And that's a massive deal for them. Wow. It's not a year. So th- there are some people that do it. There are some people that still do it. Um, uh, but I don't hear of a lot of them actually coming over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so you, you, you then, from Pakistan, your father decided, okay, well, there's better opportunity for us elsewhere. What happened? Um, back then, things, things were a little bit easier. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of these sponsors that were being offered uh, to, to a lot of people back there. Um, now, Australia wasn't as populated. They, did, they didn't have as, as, ma- as many migrants from Afghanistan back then. Uh, as they do now, so we uh, basically applied for a refugee visa, a family refugee visa, and uh, little did we know that it gets accepted. We didn't count on it. Okay. We didn't think, you know, it would happen. I mean, we we knew of a lot of people that had tried it, you know, two or three times, and uh, every time there was a little bit of an excuse given by the embassy saying, you know, now is not the right time. We can't. Well, we have reached capacity and whatnot. But uh, for us, it happened within within a year. Which uh, which was very surprising, but yeah, qadr of Allah azza wa jal. But no, definitely the conversion from one religion to another had absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, now, w- when I when I decided to to leave Islam, I left it because I saw people preaching one thing, doing something else. So I saw hypocrisy, and um, it affected me greatly because. When I saw the Muslims that were around me, the Muslimin that were around me that were uh, preaching one thing, practicing something else, they wanted uh, you to uh, prohibit for yourself haram, but they indulge in the haram themselves. It um, it kind of you know it kind of stuck with me, and I I started viewing everybody from that uh, that one perspective, you know, from from, from that hypocrite um, kind of a kind of a filter that. Even the people that I saw that uh, that were Muslim, you know, uh, f- looking like a Muslim, I thought, now these guys are hypocrites. Mm. So when we came to Australia, Australia now, because I, I lived in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, predominantly Muslim population, where Islam is very popular, people are encouraged to be Muslim. The more you act as a Muslim, the more uh, you put the persona of a, of a Muslim, the more you are rewarded by the society. Um, I kind of thought, you know, all the Muslims that I'm saying, they're all hypocrites. They they don't really truly believe in it, because at the time the uh, the text of Islam is not available to us either. The teachers, maybe they're teaching Islam, maybe they're not. We don't know. Um, at that time, now things, of course, things have changed uh, with the age of information. So when when I came to Australia, the first few people that I started uh, to deal with that were Muslim, it kind of kind of was a shock to me like why are you pretending to be a muslim now <laughs> yeah. and they kept saying i'm not pretending you know this is this is what i really believe and um this is of course when i was when i was about uh, perhaps 18 years of age yeah but before that um yep. you got into into buddhism yes yes so when i first came to australia i i turned 14 when i came to australia yeah. uh as a as a young boy the 
uh, first, the of all, ones. first of all, what was what was it like coming from Pakistan to Afghanistan to Australia? Was there any culture shock? You know, did, did it seem did it seem different in any way? Uh, the war environment had taught me um, as a child that grew up in a, in a war zone that you don't expect things. You know, mm-hmm. you you can't adapt with the situation. Whatever whatever that comes your way, uh, you take it. So initially, I didn't I didn't feel different. So it was just like as if you go from here to Canberra. Okay. Or to Sydney, yeah. you don't really feel the difference, uh, even though the language changes, the way the lifestyle changes, and all of that. But that 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 mindset. I guess you noticed we, though it wasn't as busy as the majority of these cities that you're at. You know, it was more relaxed. People were helping more financially. Um, you know, speaking because you've got Centrelink here and and you've got a lot of other programs. Look, you know. I guess a few of them are, you know, Salvation Army. Even though they um, have been on the media uh, talking, you know, them them apparently not giving majority of the stuff that they get from people, donations that they get from people, they still help. So, did you feel any of that? Like gradually, that? gradually, I noticed all of that. But of course, that that was something that my father and my mother felt mm-hmm. a lot more. I, I was a fourteen year old kid. Um, but the, one of the things that I noticed that first day that I came in here standing on the driveway uh i noticed how silent it was yeah, it was quiet <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful isn't it uh no it wasn't at the not time. for you yeah, for no. me it is man I love <laughs> no 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 it wasn't at the time of course it is now i've, I've gotten used to it yeah, yeah, yeah you know in pakistan we would uh but obviously kinda, growing up you know for till you were 14 years old hearing that life yes. you know around you being so busy and so you know yes then coming yes. here in the quiet and you're like oh, i'm not used to this yeah i'm 14 <laughs> years old you know i've grown up and I'm used to uh, it being loud, you know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I did, I did feel those uh, those you know little differences. Uh, well, one of the other things that I kind of had to get used to, because uh, my brother was already here, he had married down here, and my brother was uh, kind of teaching me, you know, when you stand in line, you have to leave about a meter or two meters. You know, from the person in front of you, <laughs> I'm thinking what? Because in <laughs> Afghanistan, I mean, even if you travel to Dubai, you know. They they are kind of you know looking over each other's shoulder, <laughs> even when you uh, when you're opening up personal documentation. Like they they you haven't noticed it yet? No, you haven't. All right. ne- next time you travel to the way, look at it. Okay. Like they stand this close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no there's no sense of hey this is my you know personal space over there. Yeah. Everybody's kind of no, you know at love, each other's face. Yeah, we love our personal space. Yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. So that 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 was one of the other things that I noticed. Um, immediately but obviously slowly slowly growing up going to a language school yeah. where everybody was um, you know a, a migrant that was a very familiar and comfortable environment I wasn't in a uh, I wasn't the odd one out in you know in the room did everybody. you go to school or did you go to like did you go to a secondary school here or did you just go to somewhere to learn English no no we first went to a language school so that that, that was in Maribyrnong um, it was they, they had a secondary college, Marvinon like Secondary ESL, College. ESL, ESL that's yeah, right. There. Okay. Yeah, English as a second language. And they had a massive, massive complex for um, uh, students that had just come from uh, from overseas. They were so, they were young enough to be trained, you know, trained in the, um, in, in language and then sent over to the school. Okay. So they, that particular complex was for kids. It wasn't for grown-ups. So I was there for three terms. Um, and then from there, I learned enough English, obviously in a comfortable environment where everybody was from all over the world. And um, I was, you know, uh, I was seeing people of different color, people of different, you know, uh, different looks. Um, first time I was looking at Asians, uh, the first friend that I had from Africa. Um, so I was kind of getting getting used to all of that, um, you know, the, uh, the difference between Pakistan and, uh, and Australia and Afghanistan. Um, it, the when I went to school in Footscray City College, yeah. uh, in the last term of E9, immediately the surroundings changed. You know, because when I was in language school, surrounded by migrants, they were all uh, people that kind of you know came came from a rough society, mm-hmm. so we all kind of handled each other the same way. But when I went to school, things suddenly changed. You know, I noticed that. People are much more trusting mm-hmm. for some reason. <laughs> and that, that was a little bit of a shock. Like every story that I tell you, you're going to believe me, you know, you're not going <laughs> to tell me you're lying. And, uh, you know, this is very popular in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, where people, 
we say love i'm not sure i'm not i'm not sure how to translate it in english but you know we just lie yeah. <laughs> casually um and people you know people down here they they didn't have their guards up you know so they're more very gullible relaxed. in in that sense absolutely yeah. yeah so i i grew up to realize that uh why should they care about your lies you know what i mean they they only uh, they they live life based on uh who they are and what they see and they you know they're not very social uh in general so that that was one of the biggest shocks like you know why why is there so much trust between people down here why is there you know no fights as in you know that that social fighting um uh for dominance why well, you know everybody just kind of accepts each other that was the biggest shock that uh, that I went through um and that was probably when I was maybe 15 or 16 years old yeah. um by the age of uh, 17 or 18 after I finished school I had kind of gone through all of the um all of the pleasures that the western society would give kind of realized that that's you know it can't it can't because I wasn't born in it so I, I realized that the reason that I kind of looked beyond pleasure, beyond this uh, sensory pleasure, is because I wasn't born in it. So I knew a world um, outside of it. And um, yeah, I slowly started to, to, to look for meaning, you know, the meaning for life, meaning for the existence. Was that was that when you looked at Buddhism? Or was that when you looked at Islam? Uh, no, the, the, first, the first natural thing that made sense to me was uh, science. Okay. It was... A, because, kinda, of, because of your mum teaching that in, in secondary schools and having that type of information on her? Or because or? it didn't rely on someone else's words. Oh, okay. So science science basically means that you determine a thing by evaluating the uh, the evidence that you have in hand. Uh, there's no speculation in there. There's, you have uh, this data and now work it out, basically. That's, that's what science is, and that's why science continuously changes. Um, because as as new things gonna come into our field of knowledge, we you know we have to modify the models that we have. Mm. So uh, the one of my interests were um, in um, in the human brain. Um, so behavioral biology, uh, you know, um, basically the structure of the brain itself. Psychology. The study, yes, psychology, behavioral biology, the. Uh, uh, to look into the mind, uh, what it is, where does consciousness come from? So these are things that are usually, you know, tackled by um, by that particular branch of science. Mm. Um, of course, my mother's background in biology did may have had some to do with it as well. But you know, I had a lot of questions: Who am I? What am I? Um, and I kind of went to um, the human brain to get those answers. To directly to science and slowly slowly that kind of uh, pointed me towards the direction of buddhism because while i was uh, studying a lot of the researches that was done in the um uh in, in in the field of understanding the human brain um it it mentioned a lot about buddhism uh, it mentioned a lot about how buddhists react to this you know to this statement to that statement um because i think buddhism uh, stands basically on understanding the human mind so they had, there was a bridge between the two, and and so I kind of you know became interested. I thought, let me let me see what Buddhism or what Buddha had to say about this. And um, I began I began studying it. the the thing The thing that I found difficult in Buddhism was to find the original material. So I was going through a lot of different people that were calling themselves Buddhists. May they may not have been Buddhists. So one of my early teachers were. Um, uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, okay. he he is somewhat of a popular character. He's passed away. Um, he he was an individual that um, kind of taught me about the understanding Buddhism, but it, it wasn't it wasn't directly uh, a Buddhist understanding, but uh, understanding you know things the way a Buddhist might understand it. Um, and I, I try to I try to obtain. Um, oh, I'm just I'm just Google searching him. He's sold a hundred million copies of his book. Mm. Till, till he's now. a very very popular guy in a lot of circles. Yeah, he definitely. He's is. a he, he was a wonderful speaker. boy. He was a wonderful man. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was a wonderful uh, spiritual speaker. Um, I had I have heard 
him say that you cannot split God into three. So the way he said it was, uh, this is one of his famous quotes, that you cannot split infinity into two or three because as soon as you do that, the infinite becomes finite. Okay. He, so that was, that, was, uh, that was an argument that he presented to the Christians. Mm. He spoke a lot about Tawheed, about the oneness of God. But he never spoke about Islam, so I'm not sure whether he had, you know, any any Islamic links or beliefs or not. But he definitely spoke about, you know, uh, spoke against the uh, Trinity Trinity idea and yeah. thought. Um, uh, he had translated. He had some to do with the translation of the uh, Rumi's poems, love poems of Rumi into English. Okay, that was very popular at the time as well. But obviously, he had sold a lot of audio books and books and whatnot. He's passed away. Yeah. Um, so he he was basically my my main point of contact with with Buddhism because he spoke about uh, ideas that are shared in Buddhism. Uh, so I, I I tried to obtain obtain you know um, a physical book. I, I was looking for something that the Buddha wrote, you know, and I would take it and I'll read it and I'll say this is Buddhism. Um, but I would find bits and pieces here and there. I would find books written by other people um, that kind of mentioned that Buddha taught this, Buddha taught that, but uh, never something that was that was that I would be sure of that this is what Buddha taught and this is what Buddha said. Um, the basic the basic idea behind Buddhism, obviously, to um, to become enlightened, to understand that the voice that is inside your head is not you. Um, that the um, that the desires that you have does not necessarily come from you, um, and that is basically the basis of of Buddhism. And um, throughout, I, I, I practiced Buddhism for about three three and a half years, yeah. uh, and I was deep in it, but I was receiving but why three years. Uh, so it has been attributed to Buddha that Buddha said. Uh, practice what I teach you for three years. You don't have to do it, f- you know, for an entire lifetime. Practice it for three years. Once you have attained enlightenment, once you have grasped the world around you or the world rather within you, go on and live your life as as you live. Just understand, you know, the choices that you're making. Okay. Um, and so, even even vegetarianism isn't part of Buddhism. Like, isn't part of the what what Buddha taught. But it it gets, you know. It gets picked up later on, so it's a bit all so it's a bit all over the place, huh? So the information, like it's not like open a Quran, open a Bible, um, and and read. Absolutely, it's not like that. There's no there's no one one teaching, and I think because because Buddhism is more of a teaching, uh, the person that learns learns Buddhism, he then goes on and teaches it. So he doesn't teach word by word; rather, he teaches what he understands. So the person that becomes the Buddha, uh, the, they have now said that Buddha reincarnates. You know, uh, what, what they practice in Nepal and um, and what they call Dalai Lama, the uh, the some number of um, reincarnation of the Buddha. Hmm. Uh, so he dictates what Buddhism is now. Okay, it's it's basically up to him. Um, the the one one of the things that I found interesting about Buddhism back then uh, was the concept of the eight spiked wheel that that they say so they say right view you have to have the right view you have to have the right intention the right speech the right action the right livelihood uh, the right effort right mindfulness and right meditation so everything has to be uh, in basically uh, in the middle it doesn't you know it shouldn't go uh, too far to the right too far to the left um, to basically follow mid path and that was one of the attractive things that I found about Buddhism. But as as I was researching Buddhism, uh, I discovered a story, you know, within within those channels that uh, Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, he had traveled uh, at the age of thirteen into into India and into Nepal and had come across the teachings of Buddha, and he took those teachings and he brought it into the Holy Land. And um, you know there was there was a lot of a lot of those talks going around back then, 
uh, obviously having nothing to do with Christianity or Islam or the, the, the way the Christians and the Muslims look at uh, who the who the prophet was, who Jesus, peace and blessings of yours. But these these were probably uh, Christians that had converted into into Buddhism, and they were kind of trying to you know bridge the two the two belief sets uh, together. But it was a very popular one that was going through. So uh, studying all of this, I kind of was introduced to the idea of this man that lived. Obviously, uh, the name that I had heard, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. That um, so so Christianity. Um, got caught your interest. Yes, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. It kind of, it, it kind of came up in. Yeah. Uh, so you, in the field you were Buddhist for three years. You know, you, you did all the research you, you, you could possibly could about it. Um, you can find it. You know, you find bits and pieces of everything. Yes. And then the name Isa, so Jesus gets mentioned, um, and that catches your interest. And so now you look in into Christianity. Um. Yes. So I'm 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 looking at uh, just just the way I was looking for. The information that Buddha gave. Now I'm looking at the information that Jesus gave. Peace and blessings be upon him. Okay. So um, it kind of caught my interest that this this kind of an individual. I mean, to me at that time, uh, the world around me was a little fake. Everybody had had you know had put on a face. Everybody had a persona. Uh, the reality of the individual was deep inside of them they didn't necessarily br- bring that up they always kind of filtered their reality through their ego because they want people to see them in a particular manner and uh, that was that was how how i saw the world around me and when i was introduced to this individual jesus peace and blessings be upon him being an enlightened individual it it kind of it, it caught my interest because i thought this is a guy that would have lived his life in accordance to his teaching so let me see what he has said and the first place that obviously um, I could look at was the four Gospels. And um, I studied the Gospels, uh, Mark, Matthew, or rather Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And um, I remember uh, I, I was studying the uh, King James Version, the old King James Version. and uh, I w- But I was only limiting my study and my research to, to the four Gospels because that was the story of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, the things he did the things he said and i remember i would i would start listening to the uh to the gospels uh six in the morning until sometimes i would say eight eight at night eight wow. nine o'clock so my i fell in love with it you know so was, you were heavily researching religion absolutely yeah. i was Christianity i was looking for the truth okay i was looking for the truth and i could i, I would go anywhere to find it yeah um so when I was studying the Gospels, yeah. obviously it was the entire Bible, it was the entire New Testament. But as, as I would get to uh, the end of the Gospel of John, I would get to you know the, the Bible that has been written after that. And it would mention a man that didn't know Jesus, that didn't know who he was, had never met him, but he said a lot of good things about him. And then he would come in and dictate the rules of Christianity. And that would put me off right away. It's like, what's going on? You know, who's this new guy? Uh, I later on, when I became a Muslim, I later on found out that this was Paul. Okay. Um, but I, I didn't know at the time because I, I, I didn't know the whole, the whole but, differences. But what did you love about it? I loved the level of um, realism in it. So I had grown up understanding philosophy that uh, the nature of man is good but the actions of man is imperfect and corrupt yeah. and when i would see i would i would see the intention of man in his speech i would see that the that, that the people around me are saying a lot of good things but they're not applying any of those sayings into into the action so much so that one of my uh, one of my friends kind of you know one day we were just talking and he said philosophy has no real place in the world so we we might say something good but that good cannot be applied in the real life because in the real life, everything is about a fight. I have to take something from you. If, if I want something, I have to take it from you. There's no sense of selflessness. Mm-hmm. So in, in the teachings of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, as long as it has been uh, attributed to him, as far as it has been attributed to him, um, I learned how to be selfless. I, when I studied that, I didn't care if somebody would come in and spit on my face. Uh, I would only 
uh, bring out of myself what I had within me. So if I was angry, I would bring out that anger. If I was happy, I would bring out that happiness. If I thought an action is right, I would commit to it. If I thought that action was wrong, I would stay away from it, irrespective of what the person is doing to me. So basically, the way Wayne Dyer kind of, um, Dr. Wayne Dyer kind of taught it to me was that um, the, uh, the uh, reaction the reaction follows, the reaction is kind of the shadow of the action. So if you are coming in, picking a fight with me, that is a real action. It has a reality to it because you are choosing to do that. Okay. When I come in and pick a fight with you, I am only reacting to what you are doing. So I'm not in control anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not the guy that is picking, that is picking how I should live and how I should be. I'm only simply mirroring your, your action. And it becomes a reaction. Um, and I kind of understood that. And w w one of the things that stood out uh, to me um, apart, uh, within the, um, the, the, the sayings and the teachings of Isa alayhi salatu as, as, long, as far as it has been attributed to him, is that if you love those who love you, hate those who hate you, say hi to those who basically greet those who greet you and not greet those who you know, don't greet you and hate those who hate you, what does that say about you? Who are you? You are nothing more than a shadow of who they are. So when, when someone else chooses to hate you, yeah. what do you choose to do? If you choose hate based on who you are, fair enough, that's an action. But if you choose and hate just because they have chosen hate, then you, then you basically don't have a reality outside of the action that has, you know, that has begun. Yeah. Uh, that kind of stood, stood to me. Um, it stood out to me, and um, my understanding of the of the teachings of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam was basically of how you should be uh, an ideal individual within a society, irrespective of what the society is is doing. So something else has been attributed to him is is him saying that my kingdom is not of this world, but is of the hereafter. Yeah. So the way I understand that now is that he's saying. Uh, basically, I'm a traveler. Uh, he actually did say that um, has been again uh, attributed to him in the uh, in the Gospels. That he said, um, uh, can't remember the exact quote. It's okay. But he 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 kind of said that uh, I I am in this world, but I'm not of it. That's what he said. Yeah. And he said that foxes have holes, birds of the air has nests. The son of man has no place to lay his head. So he's basically telling his disciples and his followers that you're not going to be in this world permanently. So live in it, live in it, be in it, but don't, don't uh, kind of, you know, establish your roots in it because ultimately this is just, just a test, just a little, a little period of time that will go by and then we are going to the hereafter. So mm. as I'm learning this, as I'm studying um, some of the things that became very clear to me because one of the Muslim brothers that I knew, he kind of, he asked me, he said, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I'm a red letter Christian. Um, and the red letter Christian is uh, somebody who only adheres to the words of Christ in the Bible. Okay. So the words of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, is written in red. So the person that refers to himself as a red letter Christian is basically saying that I don't accept anyone else's teaching, but... Uh, Jesus. So I said, yes, I'm a red letter Christian. He said, but they think God is three. I said, who says that? You know, because I have no interaction with, with the Christians. I, I, I'm only studying the gospel. Yeah. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? So he, he's saying that they say that Jesus is the son of God. I said, no, Jesus was very clear in, in, the, uh, in the gospel that when he put that question out to his disciples, who do the people say I am? Some said um, they say you're the Son of Man. Some said you're the um, you're the incarnation of God. Some said um, you're the Son of God. And until uh, one of the disciples screams out and says, "You are the Messiah," and he says, "Yes, that has come to you from above. That is not an information that you know is basically within the grasp of the people." And uh, I said, "No, he clearly 
does not agree with him being the son of God. He says that directly in, he the, says in the, that the King directly. James Version. Uh, I believe it is King James Version because that, that, that is the one that I was studying. Yeah. But inshallah, ta'ala, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to search it and find out. Yeah, um, you, and if you can add it in the comments. Um, inshallah. The video, Either the comment yeah. or maybe you could edit it okay. underneath the video. Definitely. Inshallah, ta'ala. Um, just remind me. Yes, I will. No, <laughs> that's easy. So, so, so you became a red letter Christian. Yep. How did you feel spiritually? Did you spiritually. go did, and and after these brothers obviously questioning you, did you enter, uh, you know, a church? What was that like for the first time? Yes, yes, yes. So this brother when he when he said that this is what the Christians believe, uh, I it was you know it was it was a brand new information to me. Uh, how can anybody think that God is three? Um, not remembering what Dr. Wayne Dyer spoke about, you know, splitting infinity into two. For me back then it didn't it didn't mean much. Um so I thought I thought let me let me go and um enter a church and see what the Christians are like and kind of be reminded of, you know, be reminded of the teachings of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. So I expected to enter a church and the service in the congregation would basically all be about reminding each other about who Jesus was, how you know how you should act in accordance to his teachings. That is what I expected. So that 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 is what I had in mind when I entered it. And when I went there, uh, it was a church in Footscray. Apparently, it's a very uh, popular one as well, a, a larger one. And uh, the pastor, from from the beginning of his speech to the end, he spoke about his trip to India and how dirty and disgusting and also be the Indians are. And how bad the religions are, how bad this is, how bad that is, and he kept saying "Hallelujah" that we are Christians, and I'm and I'm looking at it, and I'm and I'm thinking back, uh, where in the Gospels that I that I study anything like this? Bring people down and talk negative. Bring people about down, and talking yeah, talking bad yeah. about others. I mean, Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, says, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other. You know, a state of selflessness, a state of healing the society. To a point where even if an oppressor is coming up to you and trying to oppress you, you should commit to an action that would heal him, that would show him a, a, a better way. So Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, says, um, if, if a man asks you for your tunic, give him your cloak also. Mm-hmm. Basically, if somebody... Hey? I've heard that. Yeah. So basically, if somebody asks for your maswag, you, you give them your thobe as well. <laughs> to kind of to kinda show them, if somebody asks you to go with them one mile, you go with them two miles. To kind of teach people, to show people, you know, be an example of, of an ideal individual, uh, to, you know, to, to basically teach them a better way, a better thing. And I'm not finding that in the church. And I, I never stood a step back. One of the um, the funny stories that I used to hear um, from you know floating around on the net was that a black man back when they had the racial things in in, in the U.S. Uh, just at the end of slavery, uh, a black man was not allowed to enter a white church. So this black man says, uh, "I'm I'm looking for Jesus," you know. So he he can't find him anywhere else. So he enters uh, a church. And he uh, and he's asked to leave, and when he's kicked out because he's black, he goes outside and he prays. He says, "Oh Jesus, I just came to find you." And Jesus kind of appears right next to him and he taps him on the shoulder. He says, "Look, today's your first day that you're trying to get in that church. I've been trying to get in there since they built it, and they're not letting me in." <laughs> so I had a similar experience over there that you know, um, Jesus will not be found in there. And so I never, I never entered another church again. Um, slowly, slowly, my interactions with my direct interactions with uh, with Muslims around me was still of of some some you know I was looking at some level of hypocrisy. I saw people shaving their beards. They they not um, they even tell me that they're not offering salah, the five daily salawat. So I'm I'm looking at them and I'm saying, look, you're, you're telling me that the ideal, that the ideal way to live, is in accordance to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And at this stage, I'm not a believer. Um, you're still a Christian. I am still a red letter Christian. Yeah. yeah. So they and, and 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 I'm not seeing this from you. What's going on? Do you think you know better? Do you think you know better than than the Prophet? 
So is that why you, you, you say that everybody should offer five daily salah, but you don't do it yourself? Yeah. I mean, what's going on? You know, I'm, so I'm seeing some level of hypocrisy. So Islam still isn't being shown as a, as a kind of represented as an as a ideal way of living because I'm still seeing hypocrisy. Um, but of course, I'm also seeing it everywhere else. So I, I kind of thought to myself, let me let me stick with red letter Christianity, and this is this is the better way of living. So spiritually, you know, doing uh, and acting these ideal uh, ideal teachings uh, spiritually, I'm 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 at a different level. What sort of level? Um, uh, it's hard to explain it. It's um, you know the. I kind of feel above others. Okay. You know what I mean? But not not in an uh, egoistic way. Yeah. Not in a way that I'm that I think I'm better than others, but um I know more than you. You don't Not know, not knowing. Know no, 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 nothing, nothing e- e- egoistic. Okay. But uh if if somebody around me makes a mistake, I'll simply go on and correct it. Uh I recognize them as as being ignorant, as being asleep. Uh they they have not woken up just yet. And uh, my my purpose in life is to wake them up. So I simply present to them a better way. Um, lettering, you know, I simply go on and clean up. Um, they cut me off. I simply smile at them. Somebody gets angry. I simply give them time and I say, it's okay, you know, take your time. You know, that that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but in a, in a spiritual, in a, in a spiritual sense, um the the thing the thing that happened so um, I may have practiced red letter Christianity um for two two to three years. Yep. And I slowly, slowly started started listening to debates between Christians and Muslims. Because at that stage I'm thinking, let me let me see what the Christians are doing to teach Muslims how to how to live a better way. So you're on YouTube? I'm on YouTube, yeah, mostly YouTube. I'm not sure if iTunes U had anything to do with it, but back then I was using the podcast of iTunes U. Uh, YouTube had just come out. It was a little bit difficult getting everything, but uh, we had enough. Mm-hmm. And so the more I listen, the more these really, I mean, realistic questions are being presented from the Muslims, you know, and Christians are kind of uh, a little bit dumbfounded. They can't respond to it. Can you remember which debate you were listening to? No, I can't. I can't. Okay. But because I, I didn't go and search a particular one. They weren't you know Ahmed Didad I mean? or anything like that. They, they wouldn't have been Ahmed Didad. Ahmed Didad was was too strong. I think that the his his debates are more more focused to the Muslims rather than the people that you know needs to be guided to Islam. Because okay. he he is a little harsh. He's a little strong, not harsh, strong. Um, there's no one that can com- really compete with you. I no, mean, when you watch his no, videos, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I don't think a Christian would want to watch that. You know, they just feel like okay, he just sounds more educated. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, the guy that he's versing isn't as educated as he yes, is, so yes. there must be something wrong there. Yes, yeah. yes. No matter, no matter who he debated, <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of made them look a little stupid. Yeah. Who uh, you, so you're not too sure exactly who you listened to, but what, what was happening in those debates? That in in those debates, there was questions being put forward in in regards to the asnad, to the uh, to the text of uh, Christianity. So the texts were being challenged, the understandings were being challenged, and I I noticed two things. I noticed how how much Christians are trying to uh, justify, how much Christians are trying to justify the teachings of Paul rather than the teachings of Jesus. They're not really bringing up. Uh, a whole lot of his teachings rather it's mostly the indoctrination and uh, from the Muslim side that the the question that really stuck with me at the time was um, how do you know that these words are the words of Christ how do you know that you know yeah. so the the basis of what they have is really being challenged and that stuck with me, and and I kind of tried to justify it. And for the for the first time, I started thinking, uh, why why do I think that this really is what Jesus said? Um, could it be that uh, the the individual? So I, I really thought that it was the disciples writing the gospels, but later on, that was kind of revealed to me as well that they're not. So I thought that was first experience, and I thought, okay, if it is the first experience, how 
how you know how do I know that what he said is what is written? Uh, so I kind of put the book down. Uh, I kind of said, look, the teachings are great. I love them. Uh, I really like living the way I live. But the uh, the book is shady. You know, it's questionable. So I put the book down and I kind of continued living in that in that manner. But I stopped reading it and I start uh, stopped listening to it. But I was still listening to the bass and there were so many questions that were being presented. Um, I kind of by then understood that Christians... Uh, in large, they are doctrinated to believe certain things rather than, you know, directly going to the teachings of Christ and living it. It kind of became apparent to me that they too are hypocrites. Uh, and a lot of the questions that were, that you know, that kept on coming in uh, to the Christians were about their indoctrination and doctrination. And um, so I, I automatically kind of separated myself from the Christians. And when I, when I looked at the level of intelligence of, of the Muslims, you know, when I, when I started uh, listening to the lectures of um, Ahmed Didad's student, oh, Zakir Naik, Zakir, oh, brother favorite. Zakir Naik. Yeah, yeah, yes. he's my favorite. Yes, said he is. But at, at that time, still, he came off a little bit strong because I felt like he's showing off with all of his... Being uh, a doctor and he constantly mentions that. No, 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 no. Because no, no, I feel like he does a little bit with that as well. He, is, he, keeps, huh? he, keeps, he keeps mentioning that a bit too much. Yeah. You know, I'm a doctor, I've studied. I, I yeah. think it's um, yeah, I think it, it's not necessary with every... I think, I think the reason he does it is to point out to the secular individuals that I'm not, I'm not just speaking, you know, I'm not just somebody who, who was raised... Uh, with Islam, and Islam is the only thing I know. I've also gone and studied in the university, I guess have so, a medical because, degree. Because Jordan P- Patterson does something similar to that as well. He's a psychiatrist, yeah. and he, and he's uh, followed by a lot of people. Very intelligent man, and he constantly mentions that you know, yeah. that he studied. Um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. To me, to me, what was a little bit much at that time about Zakir Naik was his um, his show offs of his memory. You know. Yeah. Verse this and that, verse that and that, verse that and that. There's no way that I'm listening to your lecture and I'm going to go on and you know <laughs> note down every single one of them. Yeah. So I automatically notice that as as a kind of a show. But then of course, uh, being in a in a gathering like that, you want to sweep people off their feet, and that's basically what happened to me with with these Muslim lecturers. I remember was Zakir Naik. I remember Mufti Mink. Uh, I remember there were there were some other personalities as well. Um, that kind of when I started listening to them, these guys are speaking about the um, the prophets, the lives of the prophets. They are speaking of the virtues of worship. You know, they 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 speaking about things that I had never associated with Islam. Suddenly, I'm I'm looking at people who are teaching Islam, who are preaching it, and who are living it as well. And it kind of makes sense to me through through their speech, the way they speak, the way they talk. Um, their calmness, you know, the the level of intelligence, and so Islam, Islam suddenly has a different, different kind of a, um, a different look to me. You know, the way I look at Islam is different now. I don't, I don't um, gonna see the representation of Islam being done by people who didn't know what the Quran said. Now I'm I'm listening to people. So this really is YouTube that is doing it for me. Um, for uh you know the they representing it in a, in a manner that is very attractive to me yeah i'm seeing a lot of intelligence i'm seeing a lot of beauty in it and so i i um i asked for a cedar i asked for a book of cedar i remember i asked for a book of cedar to one of one of the muslim uh friends that i had around me and he said okay i'll find it for you because I, I had no idea where to go to get it um he said okay i'll get it for you and he kind of forgot um, so the the only next thing that I was able to do was to obtain uh, a copy of the Quran, but I had to go on and get it myself. I didn't know whether there was organizations that was actually handing it over or not. I actually feel sorry for the brother that um, didn't hand that Quran over to you, bro. The yes, reward that he could yes, have got from yes. that. Um, and I keep mentioning it, but this Quran here is very easy to get. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's a a great uh, present to give to someone. Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. Sadaqa Jariya. Yeah, not nothing, nothing like it. And I did mention it to that brother later on, and he said, "Why? Well, are you serious? I could have gotten it to you so easily. Yeah. Well, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal, for whatever reason. 
Uh, so the first copy of the Quran that I got was only in English. Uh, and I went through the first page, Surah Al-Fatiha. I didn't know what Surah Al-Fatiha at the time. I'm, I'm starting from, from zero again. And I'm reading, you know, all the praises to Allah, all the praise belongs to Allah, um, you know, the most merciful, the most beneficent. And I'm trying to make sense of that. What does that mean? All the praise belongs to Allah. Of course, He being the Creator, everything belongs to Him, you know, as an understanding. Because I didn't understand the Quran uh, the way it is. I understood it based on the other books that I had read, the books that was written by man. So I'm looking at it the way I look at, you know, the way we read a novel or, or, or a book of instructions. I don't understand that this is an instruction for the, for the servant to continuously uh, remind himself that all the praise belongs to Allah. Don't take anything for yourself. If at the time I, I noticed that, I noticed that that is what it means, it would have meant the world to me. Um, because that is what I'm looking for, you know. I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking for the truth. Um, I'm looking for something that has authority. Everything else uh, up until this point that I have studied and gone through, they they mention a lot of good things, but they have no authority with them. Um, the books that I'm reading, they can be changeable. I, I can write ten of them, no problem. Yeah. So there's no authority with them. Now, of course, the Quran is something else. So this first page that I'm continuously reading and reading and reading and reading and reading, uh, nothing is happening. Uh, I'm not understanding it. So finally, I put it down. I said, look, maybe it's not for me. However, I still am in love with the idea of these personalities, these individuals that are describing Islam, that are reading these stories. So I thought maybe I don't, I don't, you know, I can't read the Quran. Perhaps there's something to do with the language. Perhaps I need to learn Arabic. Um, so I'll, I'll put it down, basically. And uh, as time went along, I, I, I didn't just listen to the debates, I listened to the lectures. And I didn't pick and choose which lecture I listened to. Whatever I found, I listened to it. Anything that had to do with Islam, I listened to it. I didn't particularly go uh, to, to find a particular sheikh. Did, did that confuse you a little bit? Like, did it confuse you? Because Not everyone says something a little different, I guess. Uh, at the level that I was, no, because okay. I was like a sponge that was just absorbing the water. Yeah. It, I didn't have enough information for me to say, okay, this little bit is a little bit different. So I took it as it came to me, um, and and I listened to everybody. I wish, I wish, if I took down the names, you know, because everybody asked me, who is your sheikh? Who did you learn Islam from? I wish, you know, I, I had those, you know, I had those lists and those lectures that I could have just presented it. These are the people that helped me become a Muslim. Yeah. Um, but I don't, you know, the only names that I do remember is the Zakir Nayak. The big and, ones. Yeah, the and, um, yeah. and uh, Mufti Ismail Mink. Um, of course, Ismail Mink, I think the, his, his lectures are at beginning level. Once you kind of are introduced to the Quran and you start studying Quran and you study Sunnah, you may, you may not want to go on and listen to his lectures because he simplifies them. He, he actually has students sitting in front of him, young students where he wants to simplify things for them. Yeah, Numan Ali Khan's another favorite of mine, man. The way he reads the Quran and, yeah. you know, makes a story out of it. And, yeah. So the storytellers are always, you know, they, they're always good to listen to. Because yeah. as, as some people say, there are two different scholars. One scholar is uh, an emotional one. You know, they, they kind of paint a picture for you. And they present, you know, whatever they want to present to you in a way, in a very catchy manner. Mm -hmm. And then there are those scholars that kind of, you know, are very, very cold. They just cut the piece of information and they present it to you. Yeah, They both have their own their own places, you know. I guess they do. But in the times that we live in, you know, you do want to hear that story, um, especially with proof that, you know, what, what a certain word might mean in the Quran and you know, properly explain instead of just, this is what it means. In, in respect to what Norman Ali Khan does, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, of course he, everybody has their own place. And like, like I said, Allah Azawajal says, nothing happens to the, uh, to the believer without his will. Yeah. So uh, a scholar, a particular scholar being at a particular position um, has been put there by Allah Azawajal. For good or for worse, well, he has been put there because yeah. of what we deserve. Um, so, so going back um, to what you, what you were saying, you were looking at different uh, videos, you were hearing a lot of different scholars, obviously you didn't write any of them down. Um, 
what happened after that? After that... <clears throat> did you go I, back into the Quran? Did you start reading it again? Did you pick it back up? Or? I I went I went for quite some time listening to lectures. Quite some time. Okay. Uh, perhaps I had I, I obviously had some um, uh, some things that weren't correct in the way I looked at the world around me. Perhaps the lectures kind of helped me with that. Helped me get the language of the Quran a little bit. So I did go back to the Quran. I picked it up and I read it with ease. The first time I read Quran cover to cover it took me three years. I study it like, like you know, I would. I don't know. There's there's nothing like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I studied like oh, obviously my life depended on it, and I studied it and I studied it and I started praying. The first time I prayed, I um, I had to get a YouTube video of one of the sheikhs. Um, I I don't recall his name, yeah. but he's a he's of a Shafi Mazhab. At the, at the time, I didn't know. You didn't know. You just. I had this, no idea. This is what it looks that's, like. This is prayer. That's to how me. Salah has done. Yes. Yeah. 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 And um, and there was no indication that told me that you know no, this person doesn't accept the way he does it. You know, uh, I took it. I took it as it came to me. Uh, the first time I I offered Salah, I put a an iPad in front of me with earphones, and I basically followed the instructions. It was Salah to Isha. Um, that I offered, and uh, offering salah became became a wonderful, you know, routine for me in the uh, in the day to day. It gave me a a, a great spiritual uh, kind of a fulfillment for me to, for me to do throughout the day, and I followed it. I started going to the masjid uh, because of my work. My masjid was in the city. I didn't pick it. I didn't choose it. That was the masjid that was there for me. And the um, majority of the individuals within that masjid were of the Hanbali Mathab. Okay. I didn't know it at the time. I found, I found that out uh, later on. But, but then again, um, you know, worshippers of all, of all Madhahib uh, comes in and prays. We, we all stand together. Of, of, of course. Of at Salah with a, with a Maliki. Uh, because in Afghanistan, when I was growing up, the idea of somebody uh, resting their hands uh, in their two sides while they're offering salah was alien to them, you know. <laughs> okay. That was like the big thing. This guy offers salah <laughs> like that. But when did you first get introduced into methods? The the madhahib, the, the, the first time, believe it or not. Because, uh, you, you know, you've, you've now listened to lectures, you've read a little bit of the Quran, you're praying, I think the next is the method you know to teach you exactly how to pray um yeah one of those i think if if i found a a sheikh to teach me islam and i looked for it i looked for it in melbourne and that was one of the first things that i noticed that this this community lacks the muslim community lacks is we don't have classes for grown-ups older people i i try to learn quran you know how to recite it learn tajweed i um and i and i called everybody that i knew you know that had a muslim name yeah. And I said, have you heard something? They they had all heard of schools for younger people, not for older. Um, and that was one of the, the first things that I noticed that we lack. There's no way for us to, you know, the, the broader community across Victoria to kind of communicate with one another yeah. and uh, to kind of cooperate in um, focusing our efforts. So we will have those kind of programs. So uh, somebody might be teaching Quran somewhere, I'm slowly, I'm slowly starting, starting to see it. I'm slowly starting to see that, you know, they are doing that. They're teaching Arabic. Um, there's a few mosques here in the northern suburbs. Uh, you know, Miligurish has one. Uh, there's a brother, Talha. He's teaching Arabic at the moment. He's teaching, you know, um, how to read the Quran. Um, I think Isna might be another one. Yes. Yeah, Preston Mosque does it a little bit as well. Yes. But I can understand somebody, you know, that isn't familiar with these places. That's right. To go to somewhere where he's where, where he lives yeah. and and find that yeah 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 so um, the closest masjid to my house is a Bo- uh, is a masjid that we refer to as the Bosnian masjid uh, they they did have programs but Deep they Park. were Deepak Deep Park. Park. okay Park, yeah. they they all had it in Bosnian language I I wouldn't understand them I went to the Juma Khutbah and I was kind of falling asleep. Even even when the imam, you know, this is not not to criticize them. Uh, we work with what we have. Yeah. 
and the imam wasn't very well in speaking English, so he would read it from a piece of paper, and he would make a lot of mistakes. And um, the khutbah, I I couldn't utilize. I couldn't be utilize touched by it. it. Well, I, I agree one hundred percent. I agree one hundred percent. I reckon all khutbahs here in Australia need to be from either people that are from America, England. Um, you know, a Western sort of country that this brother might have been brought up with so he can speak in a language we can understand. You know, we don't want people from overseas coming here mm. and, and talking to the youth. It doesn't work. You know, wherever they come from, if it's from Saudi Arabia, Turkey, if it's from Afghanistan, they can't connect to the guys here. Absolutely, yeah. And, and they, all, they all carry their own ways of looking at things, you know, based on their societies. Yes. So when the the problems that we face here, growing up here, are very different to the problems that they think that the youth are going through. So they are bringing us solutions to their problems, not ours. That's true. And uh, and fortunately, it is a trend. It is a trend. But inshallah, ta'ala, we will be breaking this because we are seeing a lot of people that have grown up here uh Moving up, yeah, exactly. Moving up sure. to the ranks and yes. you know having yes. all these followers, absolutely, um, definitely. Moving into the ranks, and we are producing them ourselves. So this society, this community, is producing them. Yeah, they have studied Islam, and they know exactly how to apply apply uh, Islam into the into the situation that we have. So yeah. they could give us a solution to our problem. And I have noticed uh, quite quite a few issues with. Uh, with bringing an imam from overseas because usually these imams that are coming over uh, my Allah Azza wa Jal reward them for their intentions of course. Um, but when they come over they come over as a migrant they see the government helping them out so much they have spent their entire life in their own home country and now they see themselves as an outsider in this in this society here they don't necessarily are able they're not able to um, kind of see themselves as an Australian, Adapt, yeah. They they don't they see themselves as a foreigner. So when they speak, they speak like a foreigner. They don't speak like somebody who belongs to this land. You see, me and you, we belong to this land. I I went back to Afghanistan. I saw what Afghanistan was like. I love the land. The people are not mine though. The people are different. Their customs are different. I have grown up uh, differently down we're, here. We're, we're an Australian Muslim. That's what we are. We are Australians, we yeah. are Muslim, yes. yes, absolutely. And one of the biggest issues that uh, our imams are unable to tell us is that it is okay to be a Muslim first, Australian second. Yes. Because they are coming from overseas, they say, look, Australia has taken you and these people have done a lot of great things to you. And here we sit and say, who are you talking about? Yeah. You know, when you say they, when you say they have helped you, who are you speaking of? Obviously, they are looking at it as a foreigner. Yeah. And uh, so they are unable, they are unable to move the Muslim community into the future in Australia. That's true. Because uh, these individuals, again, they don't see themselves as Australians. They have grown up in a different place with a different culture, and now they have come down here. The government is looking after them. You know, the government has done this, the government has done that. And um, we, you know, growing up here, we are sitting down. We're saying we we are Australia. You know, yeah. we know we know something else. We know different. So I think and 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 throughout my my dealings with a lot of Muslim youth, I see that this particular point of view has kind of resonated with them as well. They have adapted to this as well. Yeah. Where if where if they become you know when when they become practicing Muslims, they kind of see themselves as an outsider. Suddenly, you know, they're not, they're not Australian. Suddenly, they, they need to appreciate this government taking them in. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, the problem is that our youth are unable to lobby uh, within the government for things that are beneficial for the Muslims. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some, uh, some other communities do, or rather all the other communities do that. So we are unable. I mean, even though we live... Uh, in a, in a secular a secular state where everybody's free to practice their religion, we have not been able to uh, ask for an equal right as the Christians get in this country. Give us Eid. Give, make that a public holiday. Yeah. You know, we don't have to ask for a day off. How many of us are going to ask for a day off? You know, make it a public holiday. Um, the Although this, this particular idea is kind of... Uh, 
kind of okay with the you know within the parliament but if if two men can marry why cannot you know uh, consenting adults can marry each other yeah irrespective of any any other rule why can we not have one man marry four wives i understand all that brother but the thing the, the great thing about again this country is you can you know whoever's the prime minister of the country you can write a letter to them you know we've got that uh, opportunity to be able to uh, tell them how yes, we feel yeah. absolutely yeah yeah that's what i mean that's what i mean so the ability we we have the ability just like anyone else has yeah. we have the ability as citizens i mean you don't even have to be born here as citizens we have the ability to uh, lobby for for certain policies yeah for our favor yeah the media might get to us and might shame try to shame us and all the rest of that sort of stuff but see this th- this is this is the other issue we always look at ourselves from the uh, perspectives of the Islamophobe. Yes. You know, the the first thing that we that we think about is how they're going to perceive us. It doesn't matter how they're going to see us. True. They will see us the way they want to see us. And we need to understand that the Islamophobes in this society is very, very little with a loud voice. Yeah. They have a loud voice, but their numbers are very little. And then we kind of associate everyone else that, you know, kind of belongs to the secular secular way of thinking with them we associate the majority with this small little minority and we say everybody kind of looks at us in a, in, a, in a very weird way that's a very good point and and we kind of you know hold ourselves back yep. so look let's please these guys let's keep their mouths shut and let's do this even though doing this will do no good to the society to the community except get us a little bit of a pr point you know presentation point public relations uh, and so a lot of our efforts kind of go into into things like this. And so the shuyukh that are being what they call be, you know being imported um, does not do us good. You know they might teach us Islam, but they will teach it to us in a way that we won't be able to um, make heads and tails with it within our society. That's very true, brother. We've spoken for a while now. We've got to get through still a fair few questions. <laughs> um, I love speaking to yeah. you. I could speak to you for I think hours, but um, our viewers might get a little. Uh, yeah, they might get a little, little tired. Exactly, a little <laughs> tired watching a very long episode. So let's quickly get through the next few questions. Um, your method. How did you find it, and what are you exactly? Uh, so I found my mazhab basically. I am referred to as a fundamentalist. Okay. Fundamentalist. I've always been a fundamentalist because I moved away from people. I, I, I noticed the two-facedness of people. People could lie to you. Because I noticed that, I now, um, everything else that I did after that was to go to the fundamentals of the, of the religion or the idea of whatever it is that I'm researching. So I never looked for a madhab. I, I, never, I never tried to have one. But the masjid, that, like I said, the masjid that I went to, majority of them followed the madhab of the Hanbali, Hanbali madhab. Uh, but what I follow is the Quran or Sunnah. This is what I keep, keep trying to bring out. I follow Quran or Sunnah. If something is in the Quran, I follow it. If something is in the Sunnah, I follow it. If a particular scholar has a particular opinion about a matter, that is no more than an opinion. It does not carry, uh, it, it is not something that must be followed. You can oppose the opinions of a scholar, whether it was it is a scholar of today or the scholar of uh, the classical scholars of the old. Um, with Quran was Sunnah, you have to follow it. And based on the Quran was Sunnah, we have to follow the Khulafa Rashidin and we have to follow the first three generations. This is based on the Sunnah. So, because because I follow this, it has been attributed to me that I'm a Salafi. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and the Salafi. Who's who's attributed that to you? Everyone. Okay. People people that know and people that don't know. Mm. Uh, when they, <laughs> Afghanistan is a different matter. My you know my extended family in Afghanistan they kind of introduced me to the idea of of uh, a person not having a madhab being a Wahhabi. So, uh, yeah, I was introduced to that la- later on and I kind of started researching, well, what is this all about? Um, and I discovered that the correct terminology would be Salafi. Okay. All right. So, look, um, 
going by what you're saying, wh- what is the difference with the research that you looked into with the Wahhabism? What is the difference between Wahhabi and, and a Salafi? They, a lot of people say it's, it's a branch to one another. Uh, so the the term Wahhabi, the term yeah. Wahhabi is kind of used by the opponents of that particular um, that particular group. Uh, the what what I have heard other people coming out of that particular uh, particular branch of Islam, they refer to do it uh, to it as a Najdi Dawa. So um, the version of Islam that is practiced by the people of the Najd, it kind of rose out, uh, out of that particular location. Um, and this is not to point to anything else. Yeah, it's just for people that that might know about about the hadith of Najd. Um, so, the the term Wahhabi obviously comes from uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Yes, he was the individual that uh, kind of wrote a lot of books and uh, decreed, or, or rather, published his own understandings. He would be referred to as a Salafi because he didn't refer to any of the madai. He didn't refer to any of the, um, the, the the schools of thought, the fiqh schools of thought, the understandings. Uh, so he can be referred to as a Salafi. And he oh, may okay. have... So he can be. He can be referred to as a Salafi, yes, but a Salafi... So this is so, why a lot of other groups are saying that Salafi and Wahhabi is no, no different. They're, they're so, the same thing. Like a, a, the reason they believe that um, uh, some people would rather call themselves a Salafi is... To, is it's just like a way of hiding what a Wahhabi is. Yep. No, that's not that. That's not true at all. Because uh, I I have not studied uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab's work at all. Okay. I have uh, I have very little uh, knowledge of his books, um, so I can't speak of his of his aqidah. Yes. But uh, his his opinion may have risen from the Salafi understanding. So what I mean by the Salafi way of understanding things is that you go back to the Quran, you go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, and then you go by the understandings of the first three generation. Mm-hmm. So the Prophet وسلم, said, and I have the uh, I have the hadith of the Salaf down here. The narration is by uh, Abdullah ibn Masood. He reports that Rasulullah said that the best people are those of my generation than those who come after them, than those who come after them. Then they will come people, they will come a people after them whose testimony precedes their oaths and their oaths precedes their testimony. So, you know, people people that will start saying, Wallahi, this is like that, Wallahi, that is like that. And they will continuously give their oaths and they they will not understand things. They will... They will not have proper knowledge. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, based on this particular hadith, and this is uh, this is mutafaqan alayhi. This is both found in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim. Yeah. Um, so this three generation is the generation of the people uh, that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught directly. Mm. So the Sahaba, and then the Sahaba thought uh, taught the next generation what Islam is, what Quran is, what Sunnah is, and how to understand them, and then they. Thought they students, yeah. so this goes to a you know basically three three people chain directly to the Prophet sallallahu and Rasulullah sallallahu in this hadith uh, kind of solidifies it that these three generations are guaranteed. Yeah. Um, as long as they are you know the they are the Sahaba, obviously the um, they're not hypocrites. They are the Sahaba, and uh, the students of the Sahaba who look up to the Sahaba. The individuals amongst the second generation who learns Islam from the Sahaba, and then the um, the third generation that learns it from the students of the students. So it's not it's not a general thing that everybody living in that generation. It is only these guys. It is only the students and the students of the students. Um, and so, based on this, if anybody is to follow this particular idea that we will take the rulings of Islam from the Quran, from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the Sunnah is found in the Quran, in the Hadith, and in the Seerah. You, you combine all these three and you'll get an understanding of the Sunnah. Uh, and, we, uh, and we will go by the way they, by the way the three generations understood it. So by the questions that, these, um, that the, uh, the Salaf presented to the Sahaba, to their teachers, that has been recorded down to the generations after them. So whatever hadith that we have, and this is how one of the brothers explained it, 
whatever hadith that we have, it has basically come through the first three generations. So uh, when the Salaf had a question in regards to a particular thing, they have presented it and it has been recorded and it has come to us. And that is how we will understand it. Now, if anybody, if a scholar comes in and uh, gives his own opinion about a particular ruling that the Salaf did not say, we have the choice to take it or to leave it. It is not a must for us. It is not a must. So that individual becomes a Salafi. While the broader... The broader um, Communities of the Muslimin, they have chosen a madhab. They have chosen a school of thought, whether it's uh, Hanafi, Shafi, uh, Maliki, or Hanbali. They have chosen those scholars, and those scholars have taught them what Islam is, the rulings of Islam, um, you know, how to, how to offer salah, how to um, do hajj, how to pray the salah to Eid, how to pray this, how to do that. Um, and basically, those scholars have gone into, uh, into details, and people... Uh, generally, uh, the broader, you know, Muslim communities around the world, they prefer to go to these um, to these individuals to get the Islam. So they don't trace it back to Quran and Sunnah. They say we accept Islam from this particular Sheikh, from this particular scholar of the classical world. So that that is the difference between a Salafi and somebody who is a you know who follows a Mathab. But, but however, the Salafi and Muhabi they, they don't do zikir. Is that true? They do zikr. All, do. all, all Muslims do zikr. So the, the Salafi understanding is that because doing zikr out loud is something that didn't happen or something that the Prophet ﷺ didn't allow, thus for it is an innovation. It is okay. something brand new. So they do zikr, they do it quietly. They do it, you know, um, they, they, and they, they don't necessarily have to be in gatherings. And the Sufis of the time um, of uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab, they, you know, they did zikr the way they do it now. They, they would be in gatherings and they would do it out loud. They would do it together. Yeah. And uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab, he had his own understanding of Islam. His basis was Salafism. His basis was the Salafi understanding. But he brought his own opinions. He... Um, he brought his own understandings, okay. uh, and he's uh, it, it has all been documented into uh, in his books and um, gone by the authority of Yasser Qadi, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Um, he's somebody who has come out of the Wahhabi uh, teachings uh, and basically stood out. He said, "No, I don't want to." Qadi is a Hanifi scholar, uh, uh, Sheikh, isn't he? No, no, I don't. I don't believe he. I think he's Pakistani in America. Yes, yes. I'm pretty sure he's Hanafi. He is Hanafi. I'm yeah. not sure if he has selected one for himself. I'm yeah. not. I don't know. I'm not aware of it. But I was, what I was he listening says to him before I went to Hajj um, yep. on how to do Hajj. He's got yes, a very nice video, yes. I guess, for the people that are Hanafi. Um, I, I don't class myself as following a mess yep. anymore. Like I'm not a part of. You know, I'm not a Hanifi Sunni. I'm just a Muslim that you know believes in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, believes in the Quran, believes in. Um, uh, the, the people around him um, and, and yeah so um, but I, it was all new to me so I needed to figure out okay you know I'm going with Midlugurush yeah Hanifi I might as well you know of course, of yeah, course. Yeah, listen of to course. him and, and figure out how it's uh, how it's said look um, I guess the, the next question I have for you the Bible was uh, was rewrote that's the understanding we have yep. so 70 years after the original was lost, it was rewrote. Um, and we see all the things that have been fabricated in there. You know, there's th hundreds of different versions of Bibles that people, uh, you know, can pick and choose. Um, but the message is very similar. It says that, you know, we believe in God as, uh, we believe in Jesus as a God. However, it doesn't really mention it in, in their Bible. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to point out is hadiths, Bukhari, coming 200 years after the Prophet of passing away and coming up with all these different hadiths for people to follow, um, couldn't they have been, you know, wasn't there any chance of any of these being misinterpreted in any way, uh, any mistakes happening to them along the way? What's your, what's your take so on that? So about the Bible, uh, we don't know if there was an original one ever written okay. and it being lost. Uh, that perhaps is an explanation that, that that is given by the Christians, you know, to... Yeah. So how do you know? How do you know if it is right? Um, the indoctrination of the Christians is very clear in the Bible, no matter which one you look at. The um, Where the Bible originated from, who the Bible writers were, this is all a mystery. Nobody knows. Nobody has 
a whole lot of history of them, who this individual was, who that individual was. So um, the lifetime of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam was not documented because they didn't have a civilization that was governed on their own. They were kind of a fifth column within a fifth column. So the within the Jewish community, there was these individuals who followed Jesus and the Jewish uh, and the Jews did not like these individuals and the Romans that ruled over the Jews, they weren't too fond of the Jews either. So they lived in a society that was very harsh. Mm-hmm. They had no control and no power for themselves. They had no no way of kind of sitting down and you know writing what happened at this time, what happened at that time because everybody was struggling, you know, the the Christians were being uh, prosecuted, persecuted at, at, at that time, and just by being uh, Christians, they were prosecuted. So, uh, they, when when we look at the history of Islam, the, after the Hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we see that the Muslims have power now. You know, they are a global power. At the time of the Second Khalif, uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they conquers. You know, basically large portion of the known world yeah. and they become an empire now they have everything they are able to sit down and write everything they're able to sit down and document things they go they, they travel to other parts of the world they learn from those civilizations so what we have that the christians don't uh, with their bible is what we refer to as isnad evidence documented facts um the the first book that we have uh, that becomes solidified is about uh, a little bit over a hundred years after the Hijrah. That is the Al Muwata of Imam Malik. Okay. Uh, within the first hundred years, um, the the scholars that we have, because we have an empire, the scholars that we have, they have a prestige above other people. They are respected within their communities. They're not in hiding. They don't have to, you know. Uh, kind of hide the hide the knowledge of Islam, uh, the way the Christians hid their knowledge from their communities. So we have a community that is uplifting their scholars, that is uplifting the Quran was Sunnah on a broad scale. Mm. They not they don't have to hide everything. So we have a lot of uh, teachers that are learning directly from the Prophet sallallahu that is teaching it to the next guy that is well documented. Everything about the individual is known. Everything uh, we have stories about and we have historical records and historical facts uh, about these individuals. From 1400 years ago. From 1400 years ago. We still have books and and records. But this is the... Everything becomes solidified into documents uh, after perhaps the Muwata of Imam Malik. So after the first book of Islam. After about 100 years. The first 100 years is all stories. One person tells the other, the other person tells the other. Yeah. So by the time, just just before Imam al-Bukhari, uh, we already have books of hadith. We So al-Muwata is basically a book of hadith that is taken by the Maliki uh, Madhab as a book of fiqh. So how to perform certain things based on the hadith that the, uh, that the Imam has, um, has recorded. And Imam Malik was a direct student of Imam Abu Hanifa that follows his teachers directly to Jafar al-Sadiq, uh, to one of the Ahlul Bayt, and then he takes it directly from the Sahaba. So they they have a chain of perhaps two or three individuals in between them that goes back to the Sahaba. Yeah. It is not something that is lost. So we know who the teachers of uh, Imam Malik was. We know exactly. We know who his student was. Mm. Uh, that's why we have all of these asnad. So by the time we get to Imam al-Bukhari, his teacher, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, has uh, perhaps documented over uh, 700,000 hadith, perhaps. Yeah. And um, the story goes that uh, one day Imam Ahmad, uh, rahimahullah, was teaching the students and Imam Bukhari was sitting in, the, um, in his presence and he said, I wish if there was a book that only contained the Sahih Hadith, that only recorded the Hadith that we would know for sure. Why? Because there was, just as um, a scholarship, Islamic scholarship became popular, telling a Hadith, telling, uh, you know, uh, relating and narrating a Hadith became a popular thing for people to do. 
So some people in order to earn a little bit of money, even though it wasn't it wasn't preferred, but just to earn a little bit of money, earn a little bit of recognition, they may have made something up from themselves. <laughs> and those are referred to as the uh, fabricated hadith. Those are thrown away a lot a lot earlier on. Brother, so so trying to get, I guess a lot of guys like me, this is the question I've got to ask you. A lot of guys like me are are confused. Yeah, we go from one mosque to another mosque, and we're constantly told, um, you know, this had this true, or you know, follow this messeb. I guess someone like myself, I, I believe. Tell me if this is right. I believe Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as as the prophet, the last prophet. I believe in the Quran. I believe in the Sahabas. Um, you know, I believe that we do need a messeb, but I don't call myself anything. I don't call myself a Salaf. I don't call myself a, a Sunni. I don't call myself. You know, you know what I'm trying to get at. I just call myself a Muslim. I believe that all of those things that I just mentioned are very important for you to be a Muslim. Obviously, we're saying Ashhadu um, Allah Ilaha Illallah, Ashhadu Anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. But I don't, I don't see us having to really be a label mm. because it says it in the Quran very directly. There's so many different places yes. in there that says don't, you know, divide yourself. Don't. Yeah. So that's what can you tell someone like myself and others that you know are confused, mm. see it the way I see it. Um, what's your take on it? Well, there's no there's no need for you to be confused because the broader the broader uh, Islamic community they live they have lived in isolation. So take a look at a place like Afghanistan. They don't have any interactions with anybody from the Hanbali Madhab. So when the Hanbali Madhab comes in, they are suddenly um, faced with somebody who who does things strangely. Because they don't have any interaction, they they they've lived in a isolation and they've accepted the Hanafi madhab. So um, because today we have the internet and people, somebody from Afghanistan can come and give a lecture the way Hanafi does, and somebody can come from uh, you know the one of the Arab Arab worlds and give a lecture based on the uh, Hanbali madhab. And somebody from Africa can give a lecture based on the Shafi madhab. We might hear things that are a little bit different. But we have to understand the basis of every single madhab is a simple thing that is Quran and Sunnah. That is the two things that no matter who you are, no matter um, which scholar, uh, 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 which, uh, which location or who you follow, they always go back to Quran and Sunnah. This is, the, this is the thing that everybody has in common with. Yeah. Nobody. I believe Sahih Hadiths, but I'm, again, there's so many different ones. I don't know, like I'm, I'm listening to, for example, one of the hadiths that go back 200 years. He heard it from this person, he heard it from that person, just keeps going and on and on. Yeah. But then it, I'm looking in the Quran and I can't see it there. You know, I can't see it anywhere there. So I'm like, maybe they might have made a mistake. You, you know where I'm getting mm-hmm. at? No, no. Uh, every, every single hadith that I have come across, it all goes back to the Quran. So the Quran does not speak clearly of a matter that you will find in the hadith. So Allah Azza wa Jal has made a revelation, like say uh, about about Hijra, the ayah in the Quran that, that you will find, and uh, again the reference I will give you, inshaAllah wa Taala, that Allah Azza wa Jal says, "My earth is uh, broad, basically," and that's all He says. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then goes to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiAllahu Taala anhu and says, "We have been allowed to make Hijra." Okay, you see. So you need the Prophet sallallahu to, alaihi wasallam to explain to you what does that verse mean? What does it mean? Allah azza wa jal has made the earth um, expand. You know, uh, expands. Um, it's it's bas- it's not limited. That's all Allah azza wa jal says. And then you need uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to teach you what that means. So you might find the hadith that speaks a, a particular thing. You cannot find the exact same statement in the Quran. Because if you did, then you wouldn't need the hadith in the mm. first place. You see? Yeah. So uh, you might have an indication in the Quran, and then you'll have to go on in the hadith and find the explanation of it. Okay. And that explanation oftentimes comes to us through the salaf. Because the salaf, the, um, uh, the, the first three generations were people just like us, but heavily invested in, in Islam. So, uh, and, and they didn't have a lot of confusions that we do today. Yeah. With a lot of different madahib and all of that, so they they would when they would hear uh, of a particular ayah of a particular sunnah, they would have a lot of questions and they would ask, "What about this?" And then the teacher that has been recorded would say that I heard uh, the Sahaba speak about this particular matter in this way. Would I be labelled as a non-Muslim 
if I didn't believe in all the Sahih hadiths, if I was learning them. Um, so there are obviously quite a few I follow, you know, how to pray and, and all the rest of yep. that sort of stuff. Um, but if there was few that, you know, kind of didn't make sense to me and I wasn't too sure about it and I had to, you know, put it aside and research it later on until I'm like, yes, I believe that, does that make me a non-Muslim? To research it later on? No, it doesn't. It, it, would, it would make you lazy. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, if, if you know a thing is sunnah, if you know that a hadith that is coming to you uh, is the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam in that he did that or he said that, and then you disbelieve in it, then you're disbelieving in the Prophet. Mm. But if you don't know, if you say, I'm not sure, you know, and you say, look, because I'm not sure, I'm just going to put it down here. Like I said, I would label you as lazy <laughs> because, you, you you know, you want to be agnostic. You don't want to make it's up It's not lazy. It's, it's really because I've got so much going on in life. You know, obviously Allah comes first, religion yes. comes first, yes. you, when you have a young family, you know, and then you have to create a business wealth, you know, you get involved in projects, um, you try to do podcasts like this to help the community. Yes. It, it, yeah. And this is what a, a madhab is really there for. Mm. You see, if an individual does not want to be heavily invested, that they go on and study the science of hadith, go on, memorize the Quran, understand it, study its tafsir, uh, you know, the amount of information available in Islam, I have only scratched the surface of it and I have been going at it, you know, vigorously. I have not stopped. I, I don't want to, you know, learn, uh, leave any any uh, page unturned. Uh, but the amount of information that is there available for us is too much. So um, to simplify things, we do say follow the Quran wa sunnah. To simplify it. However, if a person does not have the ability to go on and study his Quran or Sunnah, then we say go on and make taqlid of one of the scholars, of one of the classical scholars. So go on, follow either Hanafi Madhab or of Shafi Madhab or of Maliki or of Hanbali. But because you don't have the time for yourself to go on and say study the Usul al Fiqh. And like I do follow the Hanifi mesep. I just don't class myself as a Hanifi. Like I'm, I'm also open minded though. Like I'm looking at the other mesep's. Yeah, you that's know what fine. I'm saying. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, you don't it's, have to stick with one one particular. It's really been, exactly. It's really been classed as a Sunni or a Wahhabi or a Salafi. That you know, I'm yeah. Um, the thing with Sunni, the division um, of Sunni becomes very early on. In the um, in Islam in the history of Islam, um, the first the first person that referred to uh, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that actually had the need to um, kind of uh, segregate one group of individuals as being the followers of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or being the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, being among the people of the broader community that follows the Sunnah, Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, was very early on, and that was Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And that was the time when the division occurred, a political division occurred within within Islam, within the Muslimin, not, not in Islam. The Aqeedah was not different at the time. There was no Shia Aqeedah, there was no Sunni Aqeedah. The Aqeedah was one. However, politically, they were individuals who referred to themselves as the party of Ali radiallahu ta'ala or supporters of Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Those individuals were referred to as Shia. So that is the first time when a split occurs within, within the large community and a portion of it separates itself and refers to themselves as Shia, then there is a need to kind of now refer something to the, to the rest of them. That's when they come in and coined the term Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'at. So people who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet and they are the Jama'at. So they are the majority within the community. So, um, but, but then later on, this political division uh, turned into an Aqeedah this, uh, division as well. So today you have the Aqeedah of a Shia, the Aqeedah of a Sunni. If you don't wish to refer to yourself as either one of those, that's not a problem. Refer to yourself as a Muslim. However, when it comes to Aqeedah, when it comes to your beliefs, then you may have to uh, at some point uh, say that, okay, I belong to the Sunni. Mm -hmm. Because the Shia Aqeedah is, is 
quite different to the Sunni Aqeedah. I guess I want to hear every perspective. So we are on, in a hunt to look for someone that's Shiite that, that can come on the podcast as well. We've already found a Sufi brother, um, Mustafa Sali. He's coming on. Um, and we've got um, yeah, a cu- couple of other brothers that have decided to um, join us, inshallah, in the future. Inshallah. Um, because yeah, you've got to be open for discussion, brother. You've got to understand. Of course, you have every, to understand the world around you. You know, I've, I've heard of, uh, for example, the Shiites, obviously, you know, from our perspective, but I want to hear it from theirs as well. And, and the same thing goes with, um, with Sufism. Uh, look, what sort of, or what are some of the projects that you're involved in at the moment? The projects, well, initially, you see, I've, I've growing up, I was a very isolated individual. When I became a Muslim, the, the need to be to be um, within a community kind of was instilled within me, um, was put in within me, um, because that's what Islam teaches you for you to to be a social individual. You don't, you know, close your doors and and kind of live on your own. Um, isolation is not a is not a preferred thing. Um, so I, I tried to, you know, make contact with, with my Muslim community because I thought uh, the place that I'm going to find people with this particular belief set is in the masjid. So I went and I kind of entered, entered, you know, the masjid and I tried to get a feel of how am I going to make contact with my Muslim, mm-hmm. you know, living in Victoria. And the first thing that I came across is that there's no single platform that brings all of the Muslims. So I basically had the same idea as you did, who is a Sufi? You know, when I entered the community, these questions were raised. Who is a, who is a Sufi? What does a Sufi do? Uh, wh- why doesn't the Sufi sit with the Salafi? Wh- why doesn't the Salafi sit with the Sufi? Why not? Yeah. So th- these was the, you know, the, the questions that was raised and, and I kind of tried to make contact with everybody. But there was no single platform. So the thing that I, that I thought about initially doing is physically bringing this about. I thought, well, uh, we need a central core of, say, 10, 15 brothers that were willing to put, you know, sacrifice their time, their family time, and uh, kind of go on and uh, and reach to different different organizations that are out there. Because uh, majority of our communities are not built upon the masjid. It's really a, um, a corporate, not a corporation, corporation is not the right word. A, um, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? <laughs> I love the word. That happens after two yeah. and a half hours. It does, it does. So what... Well, they 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 really have a um it's 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 a registered group okay say say like icv isv they are a um a registered individual it's kind of like a bit this is why i said corporation yeah it's not a corporation it's a non non non-government um organization where um they have come in and built the masjid. So it's usually two or three individuals within the hierarchy of that particular organization. Yeah. And they they have somehow gathered together and built the masjid and, you know, have opened it up. So it's not one massive community running running the show. Is it similar to Isna with what's happening there? I mean, Abu Hamza gets all these people um, and he's coming on our shows and he's the next, uh, next one on the podcast. So they do that. They get, you know, people around them. They get money um, taken from them and they, you know, uh, build things for the youth, so they'll build swimming yes. pools, drug and alcohol rehabs that we don't have anywhere Absolutely. anywhere in the yeah, northern yeah, suburbs. Yeah, we've, we've got that exactly in places like Isna, so yeah. he is doing that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he is. Job. See, see, the, the thing is, he's doing it. I mean, that amount of work, he's taken all the responsibility himself. Yeah. And we have a lot of youth that really do want to do something, but they have no idea how to find these individuals. I mean, you told me about uh, about uh, Abu Hamza yeah. now. I, I didn't know, you know, how, how can I be of, of assistance to him? How can I go on and make this project broader and larger rather than only providing this to the uh, north, north suburbs? Yeah, northern suburbs. To right. the northern suburbs. How can, we, uh, how can we do this to the, to the western suburbs in Victoria as well? How can we do it to, uh, to other places? Very important, but even here in the north, it's not enough. Like, you know, we've got such a, a big uh, amount of Muslims that live here. Uh, you know, just one of those is not enough. It needs to be more Absolutely, yeah. incentives. Of course. It needs to be more of based on, you know, young fellas. I mean, we've seen what happened at Broad Meadows, King Street. You might not know about this. And um, we do as Turks, you know, there was a, a, a brother that was, you know, in a really bad state mentally. It wasn't, wasn't, you know, all there. And so he went and saw the uh, imam there. And the imam said, look, I'm busy today, but come tomorrow. I'll spare you hours. Mm-hmm. We'll sit down. We'll talk. 
So the brother comes the next day, but one of the guys, one of the people that are involved in the mosque, sees him and closes the door, sees that he doesn't look all normal, mm-hmm. locks the yes, door, scared. the masjid on him, and he goes on a rampage, gets a knife out of the car and stabs a few brothers, oh, no, no, st- no. some oldies that are there. Um, you see, the problem with that, though, where that mosque is, is in an area where it's got some of the highest crime rates Trouble in there. Melbourne. You have to build these type of you know projects for these type of kids that, that are there. So Absolutely. don't do things like that. Um, I find that as something very important. You know, you should be investing in the youth instead of investing in yourselves and the older people, older generation. So that same mosque has built an aged care centre. Yes. You're building an aged care centre but focus mainly on the youth. You know, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Because the, the, the youth really is our future. Exactly. Yeah, we, we really need to need to focus on them. We do, and, and you can't get rid of that imam that's mm-hmm. doing things for the youth. And I'm finding this a lot in a lot of mosques. You know, you've got this imam that's there that's connecting. He's got a massive following now of all these young fellows that, you know, can un- that, that, that he can understand, yeah. that he can relate to, and you're getting rid of him because you want him for your generation yes. so you guys yes. can relate to it. Yes. You know, yes. It's unfortunate. That's that the thing, yeah. yeah. But you, you see, the thing is, uh, we we may be considered as youth. I'm not sure. We are. <laughs> we are. Okay, hundred. <laughs> we haven't crossed over yet. No, we haven't. So um, I am the, turning. I am turning thirty-five in, in I think two weeks. Mashallah. So I, I think I'm still in the middle somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sure. uh, Islamically speaking, forty is the peak of a man's age. There you go. So after forty, we will be going down here. Down here. Before <laughs> it, we, we're still climbing. Inshallah, yeah. Taala. Now. Uh, you see, we have a lot of energy within within the youth. You know, uh, we are constantly thinking, especially people that have kind of established themselves down here. They're not freshly coming, you know, from overseas. We have established ourselves down here. We know what we want. If we were to somehow unionize, you know, to kind of cooperate with one another and uh, stay in touch, uh, discuss the things that are uh, wrong within our society that we see from the from our perspectives and then commit into action you know commit action we don't just speak but we actually go on and take a project uh, on ourselves and go on and get it done that way we will be able to catch the eyes of the older generation the older generation things that we we are not guided you know we not we we don't know yeah, enough there's to that, know what but there's to also do. the power that some of these guys like to have that they yeah, don't like to let go of. Of course, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it very close. I've seen it very close. And so the youth, when they're trying to do new things and bring new things and new ideas into yep. that place, they're stopped. Yes. You know, because yeah. I don't want one of you guys to one day take yes. over. I want to be yes. here. Yes. And that's happening at a lot of our messages. And you're right, we need to start sticking together, start yes. realising that this is happening and start unionising. You know, start exactly. coming up with ways exactly. of getting rid of these people that are there, having a, a platform where you can be voted in. You know, um, in the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, having members that are allowed to that are allowed to sign sign in and, and be be a part of it, just yeah. instead of you picking like who you want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Instead of you picking and choosing who you want to come in, so that you can always. Yes. You know, it, it just needs to be the, a lot more fairer. I believe the Islamic way of doing things, electing people, is by the shura. So we gather. Uh, a number of individuals gather together and we will appoint one individual in, in a position of authority. And if we see that this particular individual one or two years down the track is not doing what is good for the community, then the exact same shura gets rid of him, places someone else. This is how um, Islamically should be done. Now, uh, when you when you mentioned you know, us getting rid of these, uh, these older generation, perhaps rebellionism isn't, isn't <laughs> the first thing that, that we should focus on. Because we have a lot of energy within ourselves. You know, the youth. Once we grow older, things are going to start moving very slowly. We're not going to have so much energy. And I think this particular thing uh, frightens the older generations because they don't want to see a community or their community coming together. You know, the youth getting together and uh, doing something that might not be a very good a good way of representing the community. We coming in and doing something a little bit extreme. They are they are afraid of that, which is why they are trying to kind of consolidate the power around themselves and for themselves until the next generation gets to their age and then they lead. Um, Islamically speaking, it is preferred if the youth does not lead the community. 
So we must always put our elders uh, in front. But then, of course, we are in a unique situation where the elders are not from this uh, from this land. They um, they perhaps don't know how to you know um, how to kind of go through um, go through doing certain things you know uh, that would be beneficial in the future for this community because they have not grown up here and the youth has. Uh, that definitely is, but of course, rebellionism is never a, a preferred thing. So, uh, what, what I suggest in, in, a, in a nice way, you like, I'm not saying let's go into a fight. You know, that's not something we should be doing. Even but, but even to way, overthrow them, we but shouldn't. in a way where you know you, you're throwing it out there that this isn't right. They're not doing the yes. right thing. They need yes. to now move. Yes. So you know. no, instead of saying they need to move because we want we want to show them that there is a better way. So what we are trying to do is, or what, rather what we should do, is come together as individuals with a whole lot of energy. Now, we, we actually do have a lot of energy to get certain things done. But unfortunately, the oldies have got that energy as well. So by the time they run out of that energy, they're probably going to be 70, 80 in these positions. Do you yeah. know what I'm trying to say? Yes, yeah, yeah, they and don't. They're, they're not they, going to they, let so go of these positions the, until they're 70, 80, 90 years yes, old, and then they're going to be course, like, okay, come, take over. <laughs> <laughs> by then it's probably when, 40. When you are 60 years old. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, that, uh, I'm not speaking about that particular energy. So the energy that I'm speaking of, we have the energy to actually physically come together, take time off, Mm. of our day, day day to day life get together within one day decide like present a particular matter and decide that okay we will physically get this done whatever that is opening up a brand new program or um going to five or six different uh, different organizations bringing them together to to get something done uh to invite a sheikh bring people together to listen to them you know to kind of kind of make a night out of it that is how we will get the um catch the eyes of the older generation. They will realize that these guys are actually active. They are doing something positive. That is how they will incorporate us within their own gatherings because they need the energy that we have. Mm. They just need to see that we do apply it. We apply it for the betterment. Now, at, while we will be gaining the, um, the attention of the older generation, we will also be gaining the attraction of the community that that surrounds us as well yeah so what you mean yeah so instead of instead of kind of you know um telling these older generations that look your time has passed uh empty the seat for us which they will never do uh it it is better to show them that look if i stand or if you put me beside you things will get done that you cannot do without me being there. Inshallah, they can realize Inshallah. that, brother. Inshallah. Look, Inshallah. I've seen some of the things that you do on Facebook. I think uh, you, you help Afghani people yes. overseas. Can you tell me a little bit about the projects you're doing? Um, and how so, we can, as viewers, help um, yeah. help your, your cause? So uh, initially, the, the, the reason that I wanted to help out uh, Afghanistan is because I know of the situation, number one. Number two, I have contacts there, contacts that I trust 100%. Um, so I, I knew that if, if I was to bring the reality of the Afghan people and the condition that they live in, uh, you know, uh, over to social media, there would be a lot of people that would want to help to change it. Um, so I did that initially when I went over to Afghanistan and uh, my contacts, I kind of organized, um, organized them to, to an extent uh, for them to receive money from Australia and then go on and uh, put it into certain project. The uh, water wells, there is quite a few water wells that uh, we have done. Uh, one of the brothers um, living living in the north as well, he proposed a greenhouse, but uh, the Afghans didn't have the capacity to actually uh, follow it up. But we have had, um, you know, g given away of monthly supplies of the essentials, rice, flowers, and all of that. We usually do that uh, before Ramadan and before Eid. Okay. That is the main times that we do it. And then there's also the um, uh, the winter projects. Uh, for winter, you know, depending on who needs what. Some people need uh, wood for fire. Yeah. Some people need um, coal, you know. Some people need warm clothes. Some people need uh, rations like um, uh, flour, rice, again, things, things that they can eat. I try to do as much as I can. Uh, I think given given zakat, given sadaqah is one of the best ways for a community that could come together. Uh, if 
Now, of course, because I only know of people in Afghanistan, I have connections in Afghanistan, I have only taken Afghanistan as, as a place to, um, to kind of reach out to. But if the youth, again, if, if people our age, you know, Turks, uh, the areas that they know that there's a lot of Syrians living over there, if we can gather, you know, all of our efforts together um, and kind of help the Muslims live in, living in, uh, in bad situations all around the world. So not just, not just in, in Afghanistan or in Kabul. I, th I think there are a few groups already doing that, um, one being Sadaka in, in, uh, in Sydney. Um, but what, what's your, um, is, is this something you're personally doing or is there a name to this? Uh, there is no name. I tried, to, I tried to get a name because there was a few brothers that said, look, we want to come in, we want to help you out um, from, from the US. They said, we want to promote you, we want to, um, but they said, look, because we don't know you as, as a person, uh, we would rather if you had an organization. So I went and I tried to get an organization registered. The problems with that is the, the, the most basic um, organization that you can register is just a name. But at the end of the year, out of all of the money that you've gathered, you have to pay tax before you send it over to Afghanistan. Mm. <laughs> so you would be taxed for it. And that's, that's not ideal. I mean, I gather, say, uh, $30,000, $40,000 a year. And, you know, you, you got to pay tax out of that. Uh, that's, that's a whole lot of money that, that goes away just, just so I can have a registered name. Um, the other option was the more expensive option. Uh, it would cost $10,000. It required a whole lot of paperwork to go through, which is not a problem. There was a lot of police check and there would be a lot of documentation that would need to be presented to, to the um, proper authorities, mm -hmm. um, uh, to the charity authorities. And they would register a name and you would be able to uh, receive, uh, receive money without being taxed. Okay. So uh, tax-free donations as well. But that's going to cost $10,000. Now, if I have immediately $10,000, I know 10 different projects that needs to happen in Afghanistan. Yeah. I would rather do them than to... So how, how does somebody help you? How, how do they find you? I, I usually do uh, fundraisers uh, over Facebook. Okay. Uh, I have tried GoFundMe as well. Um, I, I haven't, you know, uh, entirely understood the way GoFundMe works. Do you works. have a following? Like, can, can someone follow you on Facebook? I do, yes, yes, okay. yes, and yes I do. How are they going to find you? What's your uh, name? Mustafa Ibn Muhammad. Okay. Uh, inshallah, if you could write, the, yeah, write it down in the bottom, because different people spell Muhammad <laughs> and Mustafa differently. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely put something Yes, in yeah, inshallah. Podcast. Podcast. On that so, note, brother, um, I guess I want to say thank you for coming on the episode. It's been an honor. Thank you, my brother. Thank you for having me. Problem. Look, um, and also Thank to our you. viewers, please uh, don't forget to like the page on Facebook and also subscribe to The Aiden Show. Please also watch our earlier episodes. See you later. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.